Blank check with Griffin and David. Blank check with Griffin and David. Don't know what to say or to expect. All you need to know is that the name of the show is Blank Check. What are you going to do? Uh, well, I'm going to get out of bed every morning, breathe in and out all day long, and then after a while, I, I won't have to remind myself to get out of bed every morning and breathe in and out. And then after a while, I won't have to think about how I had it a uh, great and uh, podcast for a while. <laughs> What's the line? What's the word being replaced? Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Now, David, yeah. can you give me another line reading? Uh, Okay. Can you ask me, tell me what was so special about your wife? Tell me what was so special about your wife. Well, how long is your podcast? Uh, well, it was a, <laughs> a million tiny little things that, you know, when you added them all up, they meant we were supposed to be together, and I knew it. You know, I knew it the very first time I podcasted her. It was like podcasting home, Gross. only to no podcast I'd ever known. I was just taking her podcast to podcast her out of a podcast, and I knew. It, it, was, it was like podcast. I'm glad we've ruined this movie. <laughs> a movie you have long contended is perfect, and I finally found a way to ruin. <laughs> right. Hello, everybody. Like, Let me at it. <laughs> My name is Griff the Ruiner Newman. Uh, I'm David. I'm sleepless in Sims. I don't know. <laughs> sleepless in Brooklyn. Yeah, sleepless in Brooklyn. How you sleeping, Davey? Uh, all right. Um, I would say I'm a good sleeper, and I would oh, say- boy. Um, uh, that I basically still sleep okay. I just wake up at like 9 a.m. now, which is pretty late for me. Mm. Um, so I've just sort of been shifted over a little bit. Sure. Yes. No, I, I cannot imagine waking up that late. <laughs> this is I, a I podcast. Don't, I don't but, no, talk I'm to talk you about sleeping because it's just like, we I don't talk like about We have very different experiences. We have very different relationships <laughs> with yeah. sleep. Your, your relationship to sleep is kind of like Meg Ryan and, uh, uh, Bill Pullman, my relationship to sleep is kind of like Tom Hanks and his dead wife. Uh, <laughs> and this is a podcast called Blank Check with Griffin and David. It's about filmographies, directors who have massive sleepless success early on in their careers and are given a series of blank checks to make whatever crazy passion products they want. Sometimes those checks clear and sometimes they bounce. Baby, and this is a mini series on the films of Nora Ephron. It's called You've Got Podcast. And today we're talking about her breakthrough. Yeah, as a director, right. As a director, Obviously, well, well, one of the already, unique things uh, about her. An established writer, but she this is her breakthrough as a filmmaker. Right, I mean, established as a uh, a, a prose writer before mm -hmm. becoming established as a screenwriter, that before then becoming established as a director. And this is her commercial breakthrough as uh, uh, all of it. There's this is the guarantor. guarantor. Oh my God, David. Oh, I was just going right, to right, try though. to yeah, chime right. in and I mean, talk before I was introduced and say guarantor and speak nope. the language of the show. But you nailed right. it. You nailed it. Yeah. I mean, this is she gets to make movies for the rest of her career because of this, right? You make you make one no of matter these. how many bombs. Yes, yeah. absolutely. This is one of those films. I feel like we've covered a couple of them on the podcast where it's like if you make this once, they're going to keep on giving you money in the hopes that you replicate it. Exactly. Yeah. And then uh, you know, of course, it helps that a couple times she did, but like she's also made a lot of weird movies that didn't connect, but it didn't matter. She always had this to point to. Is yeah. this the biggest? I don't want to spoil like box office game or anything, but like mm -hmm. this is, is this her biggest hit? No, um, right? No, uh, adjusted maybe, but unadjusted. Adjusted, no. it probably is. I think you've got mail made slightly more. They they made similar amounts of money. They yeah. both yeah. basically made like close to two fifty worldwide. Yeah, it's amazing. But she, I mean, she she essentially had four movies make a hundred or very close to a hundred. Yeah. Yeah. Sleepless, Michael, Julie, Julia, and you've got mail. Those are her four right. box office hits. Right. And um, yeah, I mean, Mike, right. Michael did pretty well. Um, and right. Then, Michael, guess, Michael almost joined the Century Club, right? Yeah, it no, was, made, yes, yes, it did. Yes. And then Bewitched did OK. Relative uh, to its budget. Yeah. Not so hot. <laughs> right, right. And then Lucky Numbers and Mixed Nuts are like on. Absolute bombs. Huge I mean, bombs. she was pretty much an alternator. It was like kind of every yeah. other one for her. It's why she's always made sense for our podcast because she's she's got like wild bombs in her career. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's there's not a lot of like uh, rom com directors I feel like who like have like huge swing miss type projects on their resume. Usually, it's like eh, 
That one was okay. But let's talk about someone who I think has had zero bombs on her blank check resume. <laughs> That's right. Not only is she one of our best guests, but also every movie she's covered is a clear. Yeah, we right? always give you good movies. Yeah, too. I know. I, I guess I'm like demanding them or something. I don't thank you guys. Someone was trying to like break down the patterns of different regular guests and what kind of movies they get. <laughs> really? Well, like, yeah, and it's like, like Alex Rose Perry always wants movies that people, if you pointed a gun at them, would be like, I haven't heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> he always wants the film that exists the least within a famous director. They'd be like, no, Ang Lee, he made a movie about Woodstock. Dimitri Martin was the right. star. And you'd be like, hey, you're going to have to shoot me. I just Absolutely. have no recollection. <laughs> right. Right. And like, like, I feel like Ehrlich always gets something that's like, oh, it's like barely an on base hit. Like Ehrlich always gets like. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, yeah, right? that's true. I'm trying to remember what the other patterns that were identified were. Um, I don't porch know. movies. Uh, yeah. <laughs> porch movies. Ben's yes. got ben those always, always gets the porch movie. Yeah. Covers porch movies. I feel like Emily Yoshida has just been on too many times to have a pattern. Like she just yeah, she gets carte yeah, blanche. But Yoshida gets like movies that are often like sort of like abrasive or strange in some way. Like Ice Storm L. Strange days, right? Even Speed Racer. I don't yeah. Know. But then you get Batman Return. I mean, it's yeah, a weird... Yeah, Batman yeah. Returns freak people out, though. Oh, yeah. Right, JD's technical stuff, usually. Right, it's some right. sort of advancement. But but let's just talk about... Let's talk about and, Oh, and little... Richard has movies from, like, 1995 to 1999 or whatever. Like, Richard, it's just this, like, tight 10-year <laughs> pocket. Only works in that it's like window. It's, like, 93 to 03... Tom Hanks may well be involved. Uh, have you guys addressed yet on the show how Richard's trolls have ruined the movie industry? Is this has this come up yet in the it, timeline? It is insane the way that the trolls are the thing that finally <laughs> broke cinema. <laughs> it is crazy because I do feel like it's not like Universal didn't know what they're doing, but they're probably just kind of like I don't know. Let's just release it. I don't know. Fuck it. Jesus, who cares? And then like <laughs> I mean, the trolls were like. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> R Richard, let's say this. Richard knew, oh, right? Yeah. Richard knew what was going to happen. Oh, yeah. I mean, Chaos he reigns knew on that faith, fateful yeah. night when he like added whatever chemical X, you know, to his <laughs> cauldron <laughs> that caused the first one of those things to come out of the whatever world they're from. He knew. But I want to talk about. I want to talk about a little episodeography here. Okay. Wow. The Sixth Sense. The episode in which the box office game is created. It's true. Wow. Titanic, broadcast news, collateral, and now entering officially the Five Timers Club. Right, this is the official one because Titanic is doesn't really count. Yeah, I wasn't actually on the second part of the Titanic episode because I had to leave with my child. <laughs> right. Now a grown boy. Yeah, we want to give him a head start on the Five Timers Club. He's closer than anyone else of his age. He was also so great on the fifth anniversary episode. Ugh. Oh, that was oh, so he my was. God. Oh, yeah, he made me cry. That. I felt like yeah. I, uh, I, uh, I really, I really made up for how he made me leave the Titanic episode. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. I mean, you know, they say leave him wanting more, but the amount of people who like reached out to me, and I'm sure. Uh, ben and David and Angie experienced this as well and just said like, oh, I just started crying hysterically <laughs> at yeah. Charlie's segment. Well, him just talking about popcorn and this is like right yeah. when people are like, when am I going to go to a movie theater oh, again God, and that's eat popcorn? True. Oh again? my God. That's true. Yeah. That's the thing. It's, he it's summed sweet. up the filmmaking experience. Exactly. And then Richard broke it. I mean, the film, <laughs> like, the cinema going experience. Sorry. sorry. But right. anyway, those are the names of the movies that our guest has been a uh, guest for. That and I did what's not make name? and have no credit for ha having contributed to the world. I just want to be clear on that. Never it's made any fair. movies, despite going to film Fighting school. Fighting the war room. <laughs> Little gold man, Katie Rich. I thought I was going to have to bring up being in the Five Timers Club myself because no, I got very excited no, about it. No, uh, Griffin, so Griffin's you. on that. <laughs> I'm on that tip. And let me say, here's another tip I'm on. I just finished watching Sleepless in Seattle. I'm recovering from crying. And this felt like a night to break out for the first time in quarantine. I've been trying to hold it off for as long as I could to break out my Skywalker Ranch Rosé. <laughs> oh, wow. This is George Lucas wow. Vineyard Rosé. What year? And... Uh, two th 2017. 
uh, a great year for cinema, a great year for wine, Indeed. and this is my my oversized wine glass full of rosé <laughs> that I'm going to drink. Wow. Oh, wow. That's a, very large. Yeah, that's a Nancy oh. Myers pour, not a Nora Ephron pour. I'll say this. <laughs> these were the only things left by the previous tenants when I moved into my apartment. Those glasses. Wow. They're but big. It's these giant wine glasses, and I've been waiting for the opportunity to use them, and it's tonight, ladies and gentlemen, bottoms up. Uh, sleepless in Seattle, Nora Ephron, Katie Rich is our guest. We introduced oh, yeah. her, right? Five Timers Club, baby. Um, Don't forget it. And she's in the Five Timers Club, and she's in North Carolina, but that won't stop us from having her on the show. Yeah, I really appreciate a global pandemic being the opportunity for me to come on the show uh, at my convenience. And this will because <laughs> this is probably the first time you've been on the show in a while that you haven't had to change into a party dress either like before or <laughs> after was, the recording or like stress, I, like text under the table to people I was supposed to meet after being like, sorry, guys, it's running yeah. late. Like, I don't know. It will be there eventually. Yeah. I, I got nowhere to be. Uh, and let's say also you were on the schedule. I mean, you've been set for this episode for a long time back when we thought it was oh, going to yeah. sync up with a New York trip. And we were going to record this episode remotely in the top of the Empire State Building. All of us were going to show up <laughs> oh, with yeah. our own Zoom recorders. Exactly. Really clean audio just up there. The wind it's going to sound amazing. And outer backs, just <laughs> lovely. Yeah, plain. But that was the only right. reason we were so well equipped uh, from a, a hardware standpoint for these remote records, is we had all bought all of, of this course. equipment. To be able to record on top of the stage, the Empire State Building. <laughs> just five very normal people just standing around with mics at the top of the right. Empire State Building. Well, I mean, if you go by this yeah, movie... Yeah, no, no one would no. call the cops about that. I mean, according to Sleepless in Seattle, security at Empire State Building is like, eh, sure, go up. Run around for all I care. Or that it's full of people... And like a bunch of adults who would see a child Absolutely. by himself for yeah, hours. Like, yeah, got yeah. It. He's fine. Here's my thing about that. I think that might happen because if you're on the Empire State Building and you see a kid wandering around, you're like, well, he's yeah, some there's like three kid, third right? grade like, classes. You, everyone all would there. just have the same yeah, thought. Right. Yeah. right. We were we were going to record this at 10 p.m. atop the Empire State Building, I should mention. So our plan was to each one by one go up to the security guard and go, please, please, please. I, I know there's, please, there's almost no chance that they're actually up there, but I was supposed to meet some people for a podcast. Just let me. And they would say, and a podcast? Went, uh, oh, you should have said yeah, so. Uh, Blank check. Okay. One of my wife's favorites. <laughs> <laughs> my wife's favorite. But in, in Nora Ephron movies, every fucking like, New York City you know, like uh, doorman or like Z counter, Zabar's counter guy. Like they're always just like the wisest. And they love guy. their wives. Mm -hmm. And they love love. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Every like taxi driver. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, the whatever. taxi driver who takes this unaccompanied child to the Empire State Building. He's just like, go for it, kid. Do what you got to do. <laughs> Did he bring any hey, money? Sure, no problem, kid. Did the kid bring any money? He had, they have a conversation about it. They they have uh, $80, okay. which uh, Gabby Hoffman says should cover the cabs. Right. That's accurate. I don't know what it was in 93, but, you know, yeah. 80 bucks to get from LaGuardia no, yeah. to uh, yeah. to the Empire State Building. Uh, $80, that yeah. sounds like a Gabby Hoffman's entire residual check for this is my life. <laughs> Not a big grocer. <laughs> Gabby Not a big uh, box office hit. Uh, so, Katie, we have already watched This Is My Life, which I'm assuming you haven't seen because no one has. No, I was going to ask you guys if you had done it because I was kind of looking to. I did not think this was her first movie. And I obviously knew about When Harry Met Sally, but I didn't know when her directorial debut was. And I saw This Is My Life and I said, wow, that is a movie I did not know existed. It, um, I'm I'm curious about what you learned. It's a I guess people can listen to the episode but now. It's, it's pretty great. Okay. It, like, I believe it. It's not this. Julie Kavner's mm -hmm. a star? Julie Kavner. Uh, and then Gabby Hoffman and Samantha Mathis are her daughters, and Carrie Fisher is her manager or whatever, and Dan Aykroyd is her agent. Yeah, Solid Dan cast. Aykroyd plays a character very, very closely based on Sam Cohen, founder of CAA, and he spends most of the movie eating napkins. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good movie. But it, but it is not a hit in any way, shape, or form, and it is not particularly well-reviewed even. Uh, not a hit. And yet they let her make another movie. Yes. But it is funny when you, I, when I've been sort of thinking about, because I watched Heartburn just sort of because it was on, but also I was like, well, I, I should watch Heartburn, like, you know, in prep mm -hmm. for this, right? Even though we're not going to do it. And 
both Heartburn and This Is My Life got the same reviews, which is like too nasty. Like, I don't care about these people. <laughs> like, they, they, she was seen as being a little too caustic, you know, a little too New York, I guess. Which I also... And I feel like Sleepless in Seattle is bringing that down. Well, well. we were talking about how, uh, I guess right before we recorded, we were talking about how Nora almost like cleanly alternates every other movie between a hit and a flop. And the flops are almost always the ones that are a little more caustic. And that's like, okay, I'm going to make like a straight down the middle. Like I can do these souffle films better than anybody. And then that one's a hit. And then she's like, great. Now I get to make a caustic one. And every time the caustic one is kind of rejected. Right. But she's got that streak in her. Yes. I mean, certainly her, um, her sort of humor writing early on in her career, uh, leading to heartburn and those early screenplays. And then like, I think Reiner, who is a very sentimental filmmaker, but for the first 10 years of his career or so was a very effectively sentimental filmmaker, yep. figured out how Agreed. to balance the the Nora caustic wit with a little more classical kind of rom-com energy for Harry Met Sally. She does This Is My Life, which is its own thing. And then this feels like her being like, I should try to make something that's got a little bit of that when Harry Met Sally feel to it. Well, and she's inheriting a script from these other guys. And the thing that yeah. I wasn't able to figure out is like what it was, what it really was when it came to her, because it, there were these guys taking credit for being like, we had it in Baltimore and Seattle and we had the kid calling the radio show. Like they were kind of trying to make it sound intact. Do we, do we know what Nora brought to it? I think they had the concept because this movie is so much higher concept than her other movies. Mm-hmm. Certainly than her movies previous, yeah. right? Like her movies previous are like, hey, look, you know, <laughs> life. It's tough. It's tough to love people. Man, and, oh, be no. like, and this movie is like, this movie has to thread that really careful needle of like, we need this woman's behavior to not seem <laughs> psychotic throughout, yes. even though it's obviously what she's doing is very strange. I don't know what you're talking about. It's not strange to just stand behind a building and watch a father and son frolic oh on God. the beach. Just stand She's in the middle of the so street. Hard. But right, like it's very high concept. Like, so I'm sure that was the pitch. It's like, what if you heard someone on the radio and you fell in love with them because they were just just a sweetie pie? Were those radio shows popular? Like, was that a thing? Oh, yeah. Oh, Delilah's right? still the on the air. It's the same time as Frasier. Yeah, Delilah's still huge. Yeah. Oh, is that Delilah yeah. in the movie? I don't know if it's literally but but there's still yeah there's an equivalent that is still big today but like if you think about fraser which begun when did when did the, the spin-off fraser i think begins what 91? i think maybe this year yeah like david pierce is in this it's in the some same tiny year. weird yeah. role and they're both mocking the sort of like doctor you know mm-hmm. like that kind of like branded serious personality who's like i'm here yeah. for you you know with the sort of like NPR voice. Well, and that's the beauty of when this movie starts with uh, with Meg Ryan listening to her. She's just like, this piece of shit. Like, I'm not, who <laughs> don't listen to her. Like, hang up on her. And right. Tom Hanks doing the same thing. Like, you are watching them kind of, like, dismiss the entire concept of it, which you, as a person in 1993, who might not have ever gone to therapy or know anyone who has a therapist, might feel the same way. Right. Right. Um, and yeah, you know, all that stuff is so feminized too, right? Like, you know, like, which was dismissed at the time. It's so like, oh yeah, you know, like the, the, and in Britain they call it an agony ant. A what? <laughs> an agony aunt, what? you know? Wait, why would you pronounce it but, that way? And why would you even know this? What a weird a phrase. phrase. Well, for one, some Americans pronounce it that way, which has always <laughs> thrown me. And I've never, I always forget what it is that makes, like, what's the regional thing. Okay, so thing. then fair enough, David. You have answered my and question. You are one of those rare Americans who pronounces <laughs> it that way, and no further information is no, needed. No, I'm not. And do you pronounce it that way? Is it a, is it a Boston, like a Massachusetts thing? My aunt? I have, my like, a Annie Jackie. Yeah, I say Annie. There you go. See? See? Wait, it's Ange. Ange, you're from Ange Boston? Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> All right, cue the drop oh Murphy's. No, Griffin. As we all know, I grew up oh in Oh my God. Oh my God, oh. No, 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 no. We all know that in this I've miniseries. I've never heard oh. that in my life. Remember? Oh, you guys retired the bit again? I just forgot momentarily, sorry. The bit hasn't been retired. There's, there's no, I don't know what you're talking about. There we all know that for most of my life, I, I lived in London. No, I'm sorry, Katie, I forgot. I forgot, I, I'm stupid here. <laughs> We did find out in the last episode that David did spend his entire adolescence in London. It is the only place he lived before the age of 25, and then he moved to New York around that time, maybe a little bit earlier. No, what? What, that's what we know. No, what I'm, I, no I, I know it. 
And I realize now I was I was doing I was being foolish. And that, of course, we know that you never lived anywhere other than London. That's all we know. No, what what you, what you're forgetting is that I also grew up on the upper what? side of Manhattan till I was nine. That's where I first lived. Uptown Davy Sims in, in Efron territory. Uh, Uptown Davy Sims. But uh, this movie's not too New York-y until the end, obviously. No. This movie is, uh, yeah. But it also kind of um, but, is. Uh, wait. Like, the fact that it's in Baltimore. I well, like, that is. She can't I love a movie it. that's set in a city that's not in a bunch of movies. Like, the fact that it's Baltimore and Seattle, especially Seattle in this era. It's yep. like, yeah, credit to these cities. They deserve their spot. But also, like, the whole newspaper office thing. You're like, okay, I, this, this feels right. New York-y. It's not like another is, character so in the movie. No, but it does have beautiful, like, her apartment is course, in the Inner Harbor. Like, she's got a nice yeah. location. Well, I mean, and his place is a fucking <laughs> boat. Do <laughs> oh you see God. this thing? It's on water. Oh, it's oh my like, God. That's the best kind of house. I love it. I, I will say this movie made me really think about, like, uh, almost as important to uh, a rom-com success as movie stars is good locations. And this is a movie. Good city. Right. This is a movie that's just, like, Three distinct cities, you know, and clearly shot in those cities. Yes. And they even sneak in a little Chicago at the a beginning little, there. Just a little, a little sneak. Little sneak pic. Right at the beginning. Oh, my God. That graveyard. Yeah. The reveal of the whole Chicago skyline. My goodness. I think rom-coms need specific locations. They need a sense of the place they're set and they need good restaurants, you know, good bars, good streets to have exterior scenes on. N nothing's worse than when you're like, fuck, we wrote this script for New York and we shot it in Vancouver and we're just pretending Vancouver's New York. You got to own wherever you're filming. Yeah. And, or the sort of spate of suburbs movies, which is more of a teen thing, obviously, because yeah. there's so many teen like school dramas where they're like, like Love, Simon, where they're all in their SUVs and they're drinking iced coffee from Starbucks. And I'm like, this could be no, fucking no, 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 anywhere. Love like Simon. where I live. I mean, you could tell me I'm the so world I'm so glad you brought me here to talk about Love, Simon, because they go to Waffle House in Love, Simon. It's filmed in Atlanta. Mm, it's set in Atlanta. And the fact that they go to Waffle House for a kid who grew up in the South, like I did, like Waffle House is where you go when you're a teenager and you're not I, drinking. I love Waffle house but they never go to the city no because they're Simon. in the suburbs like they're in alpharetta or whatever they're suburb boys where is um the the purest masterpiece of the 21st century set it up the greatest <laughs> okay. film of all time about setting it up uh -huh. that's a movie where zoe deutsch puts on a new york yankees <laughs> baseball oh. cap my friend and eats a hot dog that's how you know in instant five stars as that's someone how who you hates know. the new york yankees i it managed to make me find that scene extremely charming when you watch that scene and she's wearing the Yankee cap, you're like, I love. No, Yankees. I mean, so I great. legally what, what am not allowed to baseball. ever, ever say that. Like, I, I understand Ben Affleck uh. when he refused to wear it on the set of Gone Girl. <laughs> but uh, very I, I cute movie. I've always the over that. dick around is like the greatest like bit ever introduced. Uh. But, but watching this, OK, in relation to set it up, which by default is the best movie of the 21st century. <laughs> but this is from the 20th, yes. so Sleepless in Seattle right. gets its own spot. Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. Do you see how many scenes there are in this movie where it's just like two actors with almost no cuts in a two-shot with a really clear sense of where they are, be it on the streets yeah. or inside? You know, Tom Hanks and Rob Reiner in that bar in the public market in Seattle uh, where they yeah. the have muscles scene. like he gets a bowl of muscles. Yes. Sort of like, my God, that looked delicious. When I was a kid, I was like, I got to live in this Seattle place. <laughs> this place looks fucking it looks great. unbelievable. You have a boat. <laughs> oh, God, because she's going to move to Seattle, right? Oh, is she going to move to Seattle? Mm. That's actually a good she question. Have a because in he's Baltimore. a recent Seattle transplant. Yeah. yeah. Mm. He doesn't have a lot tying him there, whereas she's a Baltimore gal, I guess. So maybe. But maybe she's kind of going to get away from Bill Pullman. Like, she doesn't want to, like, be around hurting him. So maybe it makes sense for her. Like, back then, the newspaper industry was, like, robust and she could go just work for a different paper. But as David said, it's true. He, she doesn't have a lot. He doesn't have a lot tying him there. He's literally just tied to a dock. It would be very <laughs> easy for him to just toot, toot, take his entire life wherever. No, no, they're in a lake. There, yeah, like, there's I mean, this lake in the middle of Seattle. The first time I went to Seattle, my sister-in-law lives there. You better believe I went and found that lake where all those houseboats are. Because I was like, all right, sleep was in Seattle driving tour. Uh, they're all there. Yeah. It's beautiful. Oh, God. So he's got to take the boat overland to get to Baltimore is my point. What if it's, what if it's not a houseboat? It's a house duck boat <laughs> and he can drive it onto land. 
<laughs> he ca- and give tours. <laughs> oh, give <God>. tours. <laughs> <laughs> Supplemental income. <laughs> Because there's a lot of geography humor. Like, there's the Duluth conversation. Yes. There's the Tulsa where he, like, pulls oh, the map so down. He there's pulls a the lot map of, like, down twice. Damn, like, America's a lot of big. geography lessons. He does it for Oklahoma and He's, for Baltimore. And mm-hmm. my favorite is after he says Baltimore, he goes, ah! And then walks away. <laughs> Wait, he goes, like, duh, duh, <laughs> ah! Also, having the map hanging in your house, like, as a parent, I feel like, okay, that that's a smart idea. Like, you can teach him shit at dinner just by having that map handy. Or you can talk about women that you can't fuck <laughs> to your eight-year-old. <laughs> also an important lesson. I was trying to find uh, more info on the development of this film because it is kind of interesting how it came about. It was written by two guys. And then I think Linda Obst was the key figure. I mean, you were saying, Katie, like facetiously, imagine that they let her make another movie after the first one flopped. But the answer almost every time that a female filmmaker gets another shot is that there is a more powerful woman in the industry who really puts her neck out, like betting on someone. Well, and I mean, in this Nora case, everyone had an Oscar nomination for When Harry Met Sally, I guess. So she had some totally. cred yep. more than like another first time female director. Absolutely. But I also could see in this horrible, horrible world we live in and how much even more horrible it was uh, for women in the industry a couple decades ago. Not that's much better now. <laughs> Um, that that they could be like, well, the proof is go back to writing. You can't make it as a director. Yeah. You know, we'll keep on hiring sure. you to write screenplays. But Linda Opes was the one who uh, got This Is My Life Made and I believe is the one who had this screenplay and had the idea to put the elements together and go, Nora, come on, rewrite this thing, make it yours. Um, ben, do you uh, know yeah. the two men who wrote the original script for Sleepless in Seattle, which I then believe this thing rings of her humor and sensibility so thoroughly. I think. Oh, yeah. She it's a page. Right. One it's a page one. She just with got the their same concept. Story. Yeah. Uh, it was written by two men, mm-hmm. uh, Jeff Arch and David S. Ward. David S. Ward came up recently on this podcast. Do you know why, Ben? No, I do not. Because he wrote and directed a little film called King Ralph. OK. And Major League and Major. Oh, League. sure. Wow. Yes. I, I proposed him as. I proposed him as one of Ben's favorite directors well, of all time without Ben maybe I knowing did it, that and I forgot, is, and person. I'm reminded, and I love it. His directorial career is something called Cannery Row um, with uh, Nick Nolte and Deborah Wing. This is what's cool. funny about King uh, Ralph. And then he's a normal blue collar Joe. He's a king now. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, we can't dissect the premise of King Ralph on this podcast <laughs> again. <laughs> Uh, but then, yeah, Major League, oh. King Ralph, um, Ma- Major League Two, Down Periscope. Down Periscope, classic. Submarine comedy. <laughs> and here I was thinking he was just some dude who like managed to get a direct, like a writing credit on a Nora Ephron movie. He, he's got the bona fides. I mean, he did other things, but uh, I mean, Iron Will sealed with a kiss. Nah, not, really. not really. Yeah. Ward is the one who who I mean was sort of established at this point and also had won an Oscar for writing the sting. Yeah. He wrote the his sting. career is that fucking his, that was wow, his wild. But I wonder if yeah. at one point Ward was no, going to what's direct. What's wild it. is that the sting made like adjusted a billion dollars or whatever. I mean it was for a long time uh the highest grossing film. I mean, it would have gotten no, beaten by like Jaws like, I mean, right like, after, but it was probably like in the yeah. top 10 for a long time. Jaws and The Godfather, but like it w- it was a, yes. And and it's sort of like The Sting, I think, is like a pretty cute movie that looks nice. And it's like about handsome guys, you know, doing doing stings. But like if you, I don't like, come on. Yeah, the Sting, it's okay. It won this picture, right? right? That, am I? It, oh, yes. Yes, it oh, did. Yes. 70s were strange time. But it won Best Picture because everyone was just like, that's the movie yeah. of the year. Like, who you I always wish the Oscars me? would do that more, so maybe I shouldn't make fun of it. Uh, I just have the number here. Uh, in 1973 into 74, it made unadjusted $160 million, which would be yeah. $800 <laughs> million domestic <laughs> today. <laughs> And it's like, hey, the sting, and have people are playing pianos, and they got hats. Yes, <laughs> you know they're doing a sting. Right. It beat. It's be- the best picture nominees were a touch of class, cries and whispers, the Exorcist, American Graffiti, and the Sting. 
Wow. I mean, those are th- three like humongous Some- blockbusters in there. And then Cries and Whispers, <laughs> yes. which which like snuck into Best Picture and was shot by the by Sven Nyqvist, of course, Ingmar Bergman's cinematographer, who shot Sleepless in Seattle, Whoa, right. which is a great looking movie. Yeah. And like, I think you're talking about two shots, Griff, and you're talking about simplicity and like, you know, not cutting too much. I like this is a lovely and well composed film. Yes. And I think, yes, so many rom coms now, when we even are lucky enough to get one. Looks so much like sitcoms. Yeah, like oh, oh, set it up. <laughs> I didn't know I, I was allowed to diss set it up, it it up like after all that, but yes. No, you, you're allowed to diss how it looks. You're not allowed set to it up is meant to be watched on your it. phone. Yes, right. As most, it's the next. It's yeah. the Netflix. Problem. Look, yeah. th- these these companies that make films for their streaming services offer guidelines for how they should shoot them so that they will read equally well on any device. Versus a movie yeah. like this that you can tell is designed visually to be watched in a theater. It still plays well at home, but you don't do like the the Bill Pullman, uh, Meg Ryan scene where they go to Tiffany's and check out the ring uh, in a pretty wide two shot with that many extras in the background and almost no cuts. Yeah. If you're designing a movie to be watched on the phone. Well, and also the fact that Nora Ephron got Ingmar Bergman's cinematographer is how you can tell she had like some power behind her, whether herself or a yeah. producer being like, no, 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 I'm not taking whatever cheap guy you want to give me. Like, bring this guy over from fucking Sweden and he's going to shoot yeah. my movie. I mean, yeah, this is a big movie. I guess Philadelphia is the same year. Like, I get this is the year Hanks, I guess, is is jumping to the next level, right? Yeah. Does this come out before Philadelphia? Before. Uh, it comes. It before. comes out before Philadelphia, but they're you know. And he's like year. he's like fresh off League of Their Own, which is like a tiny, a small thing, but also like Bonfire of the Vanities. Like he's in a weird. We, uh, sorry, you yeah. guys are probably going to get into this later, but like he's in a weird spot. Yes. No, he is. He's definitely because like next year, obviously, is Gump, and then after Gump, you know, that's that. He's America's you know most beloved actor, but this is the year, I guess, where he's fully recovered because League of Their Own is him like taking a supporting role that he's mm-hmm. not ostensibly right for. Like, you know, it's sort of weird that he played the angry drunk in League of Their Own. Like, that's not like, you know, at the time he had to kind of talk them into that. And uh, yeah, talk and, about a perfect movie, though. Oh, and he's so good in it. God. Griffin, League of Their Own thoughts. He's amazing. I'm sorry. I was looking this up just for a little clarification. So Arch writes this as a spec script. He's an English teacher and he's always wanted to be a screenwriter. I mean, good, good for And he him. goes, this is my year. I have to make it or break it. He writes three spec scripts. He sends them out. The third one is Sleepless in Seattle. That ends up on the producer Gary Foster's desk. He works on it with Arch, but they feel like it's not working. So they bring on David S. Ward. I have to imagine maybe to direct it at some yeah, point. sure. But at the very least to whip it into shape. Um, he makes the big change that it is the son who calls into the radio show mm. and makes the son more integral to the romance in terms of setting it up. But they're like, Much like it still it isn't totally. Yes, it's still not totally working. And then Ward seemingly said, "This should be more like when Harry met Sally." Right. And so they actually reach out to Nora Ephron. That's fascinating, uh, David. Yep. I apologize. Uh, Going to get off subject here for a second, but you and I are the uh, the two friends. That's right. We're the two friends. Uh, you know, no, nobody's like us. It's a competitive advantage, and right, it's also a go. hashtag. But I, I feel like our, our listeners may not know this, or may sometimes forget this. Uh, you and I have other friends. We do. We do. We love to have and, friends. And those friends have friends. And sometimes our friends are friends with other people. We are friends with. <laughs> sure. It's a circle of friends. Do you see where I'm going with, with this? Chris O'Donnell. Yes, I do. Because David, two good friends of the podcast, David Chen and Joanna Robinson, they decided to become podcast friends. Not the two friends, because we've hashtagged that and it's ours. But they're doing a podcast together called Truth versus Hollywood. Now, That's they've right. done podcasts together before. Yep. But those podcasts, they might have three or four hosts on them. Uh, sure, I, but also, this is a podcast that's about movies, and we love movies. It's about movies, but also, this is a podcast hosted by two friends. I really think <laughs> this is the element they're going to want okay. us to sell the hardest. 
Well, sure, sure. I mean, from what I know about Truth versus Hollywood is that it's coming from Audio Boom, our friends at Audio Boom, mm-hmm. and it's about how the movies that are quote unquote based on a true story. It's mm-hmm. looking into how real they are versus the stories they make. Because people ask those questions all the time. Is that really what happened? Was this right. guy really that? And so often things are, are wildly changed for movies, composite characters, things like that. So right. this is like, if you're a connoisseur of context, this is your kind of show. Because they're going to dig in and explain to you, compare the real story to the one you saw up on that shining silver screen. Yes. Uh, they're going to, you can join them every week as they do deep dives into classic movies like The Social Network, Munich, American Gangster, and more. And it's not just going to be the two of them jawing. They're going to drop in some interviews with experts and witnesses and people who were actually involved at the time. Um, it's an audio boom original podcast. It releases new episodes every Friday and it's available on your favorite podcast app right now. And while you're listening, be sure to search for and subscribe to Truth versus Hollywood in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favorite podcast app. And I just want to state cleanly one more time they are two friends talking about movies, but they will never be hashtag the two friends. Um, the other thing is, it was supposed to be uh, Dennis Quaid and Meg Ryan. Right. right. Hmm. They, they optioned the script, right? They were a hot celeb couple. Right. And from the art draft, it was like, this would be a good vehicle for us. We would like to do a rom-com That's together. funny, considering... In which we barely interact. Yeah, you don't interact. It's sort of a weird choice for an actual right. couple. <laughs> <laughs> like, Totally. Lest us not forget, though, we are in a Denison's. <laughs> we are in a Denison's, <laughs> and we should course. acknowledge that. Um, Whatever. They they got the right two people. Like, there's not. I mean, Meg Ryan is cinema's greatest flipper to gibbet. And, like, that's what this is. Because, you, again, you just. Right. Everyone else, you'd be like, this woman's out of her mind. And Meg Ryan just yes. kind of has that kind of bubbly, weird energy, like, in all these movies where you're like, oh, yeah, you know, she's just kind of odd. Like, that's what she would do. <laughs> She's America's sweetheart. And it is like you think about how much of this movie rests on long, unbroken singles of Meg Ryan listening to a radio show. (laughs) And then when she talks, though, like she has that like like that sort of singing way of talking where she's like, oh, you know, I mean, uh," like where she does that all the time. Oh, Walter. Oh, Walter. He did the most. Oh, and like people are just sort of looking at her like, who the fuck? You're so weird. (laughs) Oh man, but the delightful. cutaways to Rosie O'Donnell when she brings up Walter, like ev- yeah. Rosie O'Donnell, I I feel like gets underrated in this for what so she adds mm-hmm. as the best friend role and as like the cynic who eventually is going along with Meg Ryan's plot, which I think is probably part of what also makes her seem less than the same. Where she's like, no, 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 I think you gotta go, you gotta go to Seattle. Um, but she's probably too hard on Bill Pullman, right? He seems so nice. Pullman is very. That's the good thing in I this like movie. about this movie, and we will get to Pullman. <laughs> we, really we'll good. get to Pullman. We gotta do a whole Pullman side part. But this is the movie that single-handedly like makes like transforms Rosie's career, right? From her just being like a stand-up to being like a major Hollywood. Well, figure. The, a league of their own. A league of their own. Oh, fair enough. It's the back yeah, to it's, back. It's, it's the, the back to back, back, to back, back right. of those two of her being like you know brassy and funny and blah 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 on. I'm trying to think if there was anything I'm looking. I when mean, did she get well, a talk show? Talk show's like 97? Yeah, it's, I think 96. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, a couple years from now. A little later. Um, so, you know, she has uh, Car 54, Where Are You? Uh, this year. Uh-huh. Um, she has like another stakeout. Remember? She's on the poster in another stakeout. Right. She's like the, the new cast right. edition the, in that the, one. The, the sort of like, right. the, you know. Another stakeout, Richard Dreyfuss. I'm like, I know, Emilio Estevez. I'm like, <laughs> I've it. been there before. And they're like, hold on, Rosie O'Donnell. On. And I'm like, she's going to make it all kooky. This is crazy. I can't believe you cast her. Watching this, and I had not seen this movie before, which is crazy. Wait, what? But it made me realize, we've talked about this, and you've yelled at me Damn, before. Damn, that does ring a faint bell, but that's crazy. Is it, ju- is it a generation, like, because, like, for me, like, Sleepless in Seattle, it came out years before I saw it, I think, but, like, as a kid, it was like, this is what a rom-com is. Like, everyone yes, has seen totally. and is aware of Sleepless in Seattle. Totally. It is completely inexplicable why I haven't seen it. I have no reason Have you seen you got it. Mail? it is weird because... So yeah, right, like I watched other right, rom-coms. Right. It wasn't like I avoided yeah, the yeah, genre. Yeah. I was a big Hanks fan. Yeah. I liked Meg Ryan. I, and I certainly viewed it as such. I knew it was that 
canonical and important. It's very weird that I didn't see it when I was young in the VHS days. Yeah. And that I still haven't seen it until now. I mean, at a certain point, like the last six months, I've been like, well, don't watch it yet. Wait to. Well, sure. But that's not explaining the other 20 odd years of of not seeing this. Right. There were 30 (laughs) years where I was really lagging on it. I actually I hadn't seen I hadn't seen this. uh, You've got mail or. When Harry Met Sally until in the past oh, wow. few years. I mean, it's just demented. I know it's generational slightly that all of those movies definitely do belong to, you know, the last generation a little bit. Um, no, the other two I saw often and early. I feel like Harry Met Sally and uh, You've Got Mail. I want to go back to the thread that, that Katie was pulling on, though. This Hanks moment, because mm-hmm. you go like Hanks is sitcom star. He's like really kind of like harmless, goofy, fun guy. And then he sort of surprisingly makes the jump to movies. You know, he doesn't seem like, oh, the guy from Bosom Bodies is obviously going to become a leading man. Yeah, I mean. But then it's like sort of yeah, like splash in auspicious Bachelor start. Party and the money pit. Right, I'm saying right. like Bachelor yeah. Party is like, okay, what you expect the bottom Bosom Buddies guy to go on to. But then that's a surprise hit. Then like Splash is like, oh, that's a breakthrough. That's like a new level for him. That Those was such are the a surprise same year. hit movie. Crazy. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Crazy. So that's like building and building and building to like big where he gives this magnificent performance, gets an Oscar nomination. Everyone's like, oh, I think we like kind of underrated him. He's a little more than just a comedy guy. And then there's that massive, massive misstep with uh, Bonfire. Of the well, Bandies. but it goes after big, it goes the Burbs, which I like, but was not like not a hit at the time or whatever. You know what I mean? Like Burbs sort of little. It was a hit. Was a little too was dark. Was right, that whatever. one of those things that was like made before he knew big was going to be a big thing? Possibly. I think possibly, so. Right. And it was it was a hit because I looked it up and the Burbs was the number one film at the box office the weekend I was born. Oh, that's oh. Nice. People were doing no, no, that challenge. The Burbs did okay, but like the Burbs was just a little, uh, you know, whatever. It was not yes. a sensation. Turner and Hooch, which obviously he's like kind of embarrassed by. Ben probably likes. But but was a, it hit. Was a hit? Yeah, but like not a I mean, not was, a movie people the, take seriously. Not the kind of thing no, you pivot off no. an Oscar nomination into. I think it was a why is Hanks doing a dog and then movie in, in thing? In 1990, but it was embarrassingly successful. 1990, he has Joe versus dog the Volcano movie. and Bonfire of the Vanity same year. So people wow. are kind of like he's fucking up. Like yeah, when he's yeah. in like, League we gave of Their Own, like, we loved you doing the thing. Yeah, yeah, and I think if anything, people are going like. Maybe he needs to know his limitations, Mm -hmm. which is a weird thing to think about Tom Hanks now. But at that time, they were like, what's he doing? He's going supernatural. He's doing dark comedies. He shouldn't be doing any of this stuff. Like, Hanks is like a puppy dog. He's a little boy. But then, like... Like, no, you're lame. 1993, with Sleepless in Seattle, which is, you know, like, it's just like, yep, he's a great rom-com lead who can, like, who you can fall in love with, and he'll open your movie. And then Philadelphia, he wins an Oscar... That's it. He's just locked into place. And, it, and from yeah. there on, it's just every movie is a hit. Totally. But this is what I want to talk about because Katie brought this up. The fact that League of Their Own is the year before this, that was a film that I think he signed on to late. The character was written to be older. Yeah. People were surprised he was doing it. And on its face, I think it probably looked like here he goes making the fucking bonfire mistake again. You know, because Bonfire, everyone said, like, the guy's too likable. This character is more complicated. Yes. You shouldn't have right. cast he's, this puppy dog a guy. He's miscasting Bonfire for that reason. He doesn't seem like someone with a dark edge. Right. So on its face, you're like, like, look at their own. The guy is just, he, he, here you go. This is the final nail in the coffin. The guy's fucking himself over. This part should be someone in their 50s. It should be someone ornery. It shouldn't be Tom Hanks. And that is like, I think, such a big corrective to being like, no, I figured out how to modulate myself. I can make myself work in different types of movies. But because a totally so the their own so, is so important for that too, and that it's funny totally. and like yeah. he is like a mean guy, but you need to be rooting for him. Like you need that friendship between yeah. him and Gina Davis to take flight. And also you've got John Lovitz, who's like the more ordinary person you compare him to, where he's like like trash talking all the women. So you get to Tom Hanks, he doesn't seem so bad. And like the worst thing he does is pee for a really long time, which I will Never forget for the rest of my life. I mean, um, the peeing is well, it's great. inexcusable. He should have been arrested. <laughs> yes, he and Austin Powers both should have been arrested for how long they peed. God, two long peeing jokes of the '90s that like really forged my sense of humor. I should think about that. But I do think yes, it, it's like the fact that that movie is a little bit more austere than anything he had been in up until that point. 
even though it's a funny movie and it's a crowd pleaser, it is a little bit less of a straightforward comedy and something like, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, Bonfire fails from veering too far into comedy. Like that's uh, Bonfire the movie is that kind insane. of shows... You can't, you can't even begin with Bonfire. Disaster. That movie is absolutely saying, out of its mind. League of Their Own is both Hank saying, wait a second, I know how to use myself. I can fit into different movies. I can play different types of people and I can fit into different tones. I think that's the big thing. Yeah, and you see him like kind of going from that of like being comfortable in his own skin and League of Their Own to Sleepless in Seattle where he walks into this rom-con setup and he just feels like as cozy and as like yeah. ready for this as you can imagine. Like you he, think he's made he's 10 so rom-coms this before this. My God, he's totally. so good. Uh, and you're like, oh, he pretty much had just, in terms of straight rom-coms, done... Joe versus the volcano, which is the furthest thing from a straight rom com. Yeah, and I mean, Splash is sort of a rom com. And Splash, and Splash. Yeah. I mean, it's I'm kind sorry. of like Splash. a big, high concept. Big, not really. Big is sort of a rom. It's a comedy. I mean, Big is so weird because he does have sex with the woman. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's well. not a movie you want to look back on and then remember the no. romance. I think, <laughs> yeah. I, Big is a movie where I, I feel like every week someone tweets like, I just watched Big. I had seen Big. I forgot he actually fucks her. <laughs> like, and there's a version a of lot. that every week. Yes, yeah. Um, like a lot. It's not like, oh, one time they fucked. You would never fuck. do that the movie now. Like, is they like don't have sex in 13. Nine and a half 30. weeks. Right? Like, no, no. there's no, like, that, it's not something you would do in an age. It's not Shazam, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God, but what a title. <laughs> what? Big? Which one? Ben, Big. My favorite movie title. Big. Yeah. Big and Splash, Ben? It's like, Splash. No, really? Back to back. <laughs> All of your interests. <laughs> yeah, what Seriously. if you were just in a movie called Bones? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's then a show. Then I would be... Yeah, I would be a hundred percent. I mean, it's also he remade the Snoop Dogg horror film. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, it's also wild that he was in a movie called Toy Story, which is Griffin's favorite movie, but also mm -hmm. favorite movie title. Like, you know, that just sounds like a movie for Griffin. <laughs> uh, excuse me, correction. My favorite movie title is Toy Story yeah, Two. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> um, but he's so good in this. Yes, I just was gonna say though, there's eight years in between Splash yeah. and Sleepless, which means he has the time to sort of grow the fuck up. And like yeah. big, he's a boy, and the other ones we're talking about are so heightened or weird tonally that this is like his first time since Splash and his first time ever in like a completely grounded, real world adult rom com. And as you said, Katie, he just enters into this being like, I fucking got yeah. this. Hold my beer. I know exactly who Tom Hanks is on screen. Um, and sharing a bunch of scenes with a kid, which like you imagine like finding oh. your level, like when you, you know, that first big scene they have where they're on the phones together, like that's a crazy challenge. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, the kid's so good. It, he's, he's one really of those good. so good. He's one of those kids who just is like a accountant now, right? Like, yeah, he works at a car I think so. Uh, <laughs> excuse me, he became the voice of TJ in recess. He was the <gasps> voice of TJ show in, is the, iconic. The, in the first season. Of recess oh, and then was replaced. replaced. Oh, yikes. Oh. He retired. He, Puberty. I think he re I think yeah, he retired from acting when he, right, exactly. When it was no longer a cute kid. Okay. Do we think Colin was like about this age at the time? Because their their chemistry is very cute. Wait, 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 Colin. Wait, what about Colin? Colin Hanks. Because oh. at this point, I believe Chet Hanks is about my age. Yeah, so, Chet's, I mean, Chet's really he's little. just born around this time. Colin Hanks He's is like late seventies, I think. Yeah, Colin Hanks was born in the. Yeah. He would have been a teenager at this point, but um. Okay. But also, but well, Tom's a young dad. Yes, but also Tom. Yeah, he was a young. You dad. know, they were they were divorced, and like you know, I, I think I you know Tom t Tom's first two kids, I think were 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 with the mom a lot and all that. Because like that's the whole thing with everyone. With everyone's like, what's up with Chet Hanks? And it's like, well, <laughs> basically only new post Gump. Like, right? Like, you know, like, at that point, Tom Hanks is just a megastar. Like, yeah, it's, okay. it's just a different world. Like, Colin Hanks was born when Tom Hanks was a nobody. Is, yeah. is Chet the one with all the tattoos? Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah so Chet's the, the one, one who wrapped in Patois at the Golden Globes? Yeah. Yeah, Chet, Chet Hanks. And gave his 
uh, coronavirus announcement. Like, my that dad's doing touching, okay. Though. That shirtless. was touching, like, though. It was. Like, Chad Hayes really stepped up. I, I like Cuomo. That's the thing where he was like, hey, what's what, what, what? Like, my, my parents got the Rona. I'm like, Chet, you're really you're really handling with this the right amount of sensitivity. <laughs> that was when, like, Trump Chet- wouldn't, like, say the word coronavirus. And Chet Hayes right. is like, we all need yeah. to stay home and, like, wash our hands. Right. <laughs> Chet, I, Chet I, was handling this better than almost every elected official in the United definitely. States of America. At the same time, though, I can only imagine like Tom and Rita like quarantining in Australia and like having to deal with that. And then at the same time being like, oh, God, Chet released a video. <laughs> oh, God. What are their Instagram alerts like for Chet? Like, do they get them all or do they try like to have someone else watch them so that they don't have to see everything? Their agents definitely step in whenever Chet. Yeah, does no, something. I feel like they try not to be alerted. It is fun. Funny that like Tom Hanks's key reputation is America's dad, but also Tom Hanks's son is like America's, America's worst kind son. of embarrassing son. <laughs> you do have Colin, who's just like, hey, I'm Colin Hanks. Yeah. I'm a regular yeah, guy. And um, Elizabeth, who's the who's his only daughter, I think. She's like a writer. She yeah. has a solid reputation. And there's a fourth one, like Sherman, what's his name? Like Chet, like Chet is Chester, and then the other one I, has like a very pre- I, Truman? I, he's Truman. got a young Truman's, daughter too. Oh, he yeah. does? No. Yeah. No. He has no. No. He yes. has a granddaughter. Yeah. Oh. Chet has a kid. College yeah. kids. Colin yeah, and yeah. Elizabeth. I've googled with, this with, recently. Colin and Elizabeth are his, his uh, kids with his first wife, and then Chester and Truman. Truman. Yes. Yes. Or yes. yeah. Um, so we had I... Truman with Rita. Yeah. But yeah, Chester, Colin Hanks Chester has like Andrew. a handkerchief company. Like very different people. <laughs> Why did I think he had a younger daughter? I don't know. Okay, uh, well, I'm very wrong. He's just starting yeah. rumors about Tom Hanks. But yeah, God. seriously. Yeah, he also uh, uh, has a dungeon underneath his basement. <laughs> so the thing I was going to say... Henry Winkler over here. <laughs> we've, talked, we've talked about this before, that it is one of those things. It's not like the thing that makes a movie star, but it's one of those things that can give someone an edge is when they're really good with kids. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Because Clooney. it is so hard as an actor to fake it with kids. Right. You were bringing up on some previous episode how that was kind of the thing that made Clooney a star, how good he was with kids on ER yeah. was sort of what pushed him over the edge. I don't think it's a coincidence that like that's what finally got Dustin Hoffman an Oscar mm. was being so good with a kid in a yeah. movie. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. I mean, of course. And like, I mean, of, of course, in Kramer versus Kramer, it's like the premise of that movie is like, what if a dad had to spend all the time with the kid? Like, you know, it's still, <laughs> yeah. it's still ludicrous in Kramer versus Kramer. By this, it's like, yeah, you know, obviously they, their relationship just feels like so specific and lovely. Mm-hmm. Like they're kind of frank with each other. And the kid was like stirring shit up all the time. Like he's being a dick, mm-hmm. especially he's when like the sticker. new girlfriend comes around. Yeah. And like Tom Hanks is like aware of it and like dealing with it, but like not like, you know, let, not flying off the handle. Like he has patience for him, but he like, you know, like, all right, I see you making that face. And like, we're going to talk about that later. Uh, and then moves on from it. He, he's, he's modeling good dad behavior. That whole toothbrushing scene where he's bringing up all the things he's heard about yeah. sex. <laughs> yeah. I love that scene. His friend is cable. His friend is cable. <laughs> yeah. I it just, it just it's Dead. just like it's usually so I mean Katie you and I are agree on this kid actors get them out of here they're usually <laughs> annoying <laughs> I right? feel like my my feeling on kid actors gets misinterpreted because like I want the best for all kid actors. Of I want course, them all to have don't good lives. Them. I want their no. I and like I, if they are not good in a movie, I'm not going to be hard on them. But I mostly want them all to just go back to school and go home and not be in movies. Like and, it and just seems like a Oscar bad nominations. way to grow up. Yes. Yeah. yeah don't get exactly. definitely don't go to the Oscars. Please do not take your kids to the Oscars. I mean, unless once in like a generation a press tour. But sometimes they wear little suits and it's very. <laughs> I cute. know, but they want to go to bed. They would so much rather <laughs> yeah. be with their well, friends. Once in a generation, don't do a press tour don't go to fucking parties no, oh my god no You're, like don't, don't like, do let Q&As. them be up till midnight like get them off instagram no. like go yeah. if you're gonna be a kid in a movie like be in the movie go live your life and ideally don't be in movies at all right i don't care if they're on sasha stone's long list <laughs> don't don't let them fucking work the circuit but um so this kid not only is he a kid actor but he is also playing unambiguously the wisest character in the movie and the person that the audience is going to agree with throughout. Like when the kids like my dad needs to date someone, you're like, he does need to date someone. Then when he starts (laughs) dating someone, we don't like him. The kid doesn't like him. We're like, the kid's right. This woman's annoying. We don't like her. (laughs) Hank's fucked up. Like, it's not like we're like the kid should leave him alone. We're all like, no, get her out of here. 
Don't you think this is one of those characters that then kind of ruins rom coms for the next right? Because you think you can get away does with the this. shittier version yes. of this. Oh, yeah. Yes. And they're like, this kid is so wise that they're like, Dad, I think it's time for a divorce. Right. And it's like <laughs> and played by a shittier kid. It's written poorly. They have no chemistry. The film is bad. And you're just like, get this fucking kid out of here. Throw him in jail. Like, <laughs> Katie, I, I made you watch One Fine Day. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I was casting around for something to watch on HBO and you suggested One Fine Day. And I said, yes, I will watch that. And uh, I was very happy with the recommendation. Movie I adore. But in that, the kids are actual just kids. May Whitman and yeah. Alex Dielins. And they're just chaotic little kids. They're not annoying in like a, in a cutesy way. They're just doing shit. This kid yeah. is the thing that, it, like you're saying, Griff, should never work. He's he's like urbane. Right. He knows how to talk to adults. <laughs> he could talk about sex. He's on the computer with Gabby Hoffman. Like, right. like is he this like should Henry just be in Book of Henry. St- yeah, it should be so <laughs> fucking irritating. Right? Right. And this like this then has negative repercussions until I would argue Chloe Grace Moritz in Five Hundred Days of Summer oh. is the time when all of Hollywood has a meeting and they're like we all agree we're passing a bill. Wow. This can never happen. It's so Forgot funny right? because I, uh, obviously she comes out of that with a career and like is in all these movies, but she is insufferable in that movie. That's the character. I know, I know, I, I, know, I, 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 know. I don't even put that it's on not her. on her. But that's like her, she's literally like, okay, let's sit and talk. How long do you think this has been a problem in your relationship? So fucking You're annoying. like, get the fuck <laughs> but I mean, out I will say here. 500 Days of Summer does feel like it's the apex of all of these rom-coms where they're like, let's do every trope and let's dial yeah, it up I'm- to a million. Like, and we're just gonna, it's just going to flood your synapses. It's going to be completely like a sugar rush. Did 500 Days of Summer permanently break rom-coms, yes. period? Yes. Like now I'm thinking about almost every element of 500 Days of Summer had the same destructive yes. effect. That Chloe Grace Moretz yes. did on the <laughs> Mute music, child. flashbacks. I would say if I, uh, Crazy Stupid Love came a year or two later and really helped mm. nail the coffin in. Because no, like, the precocious kids in that movie are no. a nightmare. Crazy yes. Stupid Love is like an earthquake hitting after the city's been destroyed. <laughs> where people were like, yeah, obviously this is bad. <laughs> like, this Cancel isn't helping anything. <laughs> wait a second. Wait a second. I'm sorry. I just need to pause the podcast for a moment. <laughs> Katie, are you saying that you think... It is a little bit out of line when an adult gives a child naked photos of herself at the end of a studio rom com. She's an adult. She's a teenager, and she she's it, it is incredibly inappropriate. She's like what eighteen or Both whatever. Both directions like, she's going she's in are inappropriate. She's either like right, seventeen right. or eighteen, yeah. and she's hitting Wildly on Steve okay. Carell, and then at the end goes like, you know what? The nudes go to his kid. Because <laughs> the kid makes a fucking speech. Is that what he I, makes? I've seen that at a movie. Graduation. I refuse to remember it. Like I will <laughs> yeah. not. You can't make. Well, me. it gave us Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone, which like panned out pretty well. Like but their parts of the movie yeah. hold up. They do dirty they dancing. Hold up okay. I mean, he I mean, literally holds her up. Yeah. He does hold her up. Yeah. It's like he's fucking like he's photoshopped. photoshopped. Yes, but like yeah, but okay, those movies, those parts <laughs> do hold up better, but also. Ryan Gosling's like playing a toothpick chewing, sunglasses wearing. Oh, it's like all like post mystery, the game, like how to like pick totally. up ladies in this like club that's just like a right. soundstage and doesn't even try to pretend it's on a soundstage. But I do remember being hyped for that movie. Like when the trip, I was like, I love it. Gosling and Stone. Yeah. I love it. I'm all in. I, I love it. Give me, give me new young people to, you know. Well, Stand. Because it also, it felt like Emma Stone was in that pocket that actresses used to be in where they're like, they're just waiting for a great rom-com. Right. Like not, yeah. th- not that it's, that's the end all be all of their career, but it's one of the pillars you need to establish. It's the never ending advice that people give to Jennifer Lawrence. It's like, why hasn't she done a rom-com? Right. Because they don't exist and she doesn't want to make a Netflix Listen, movie. Listen, I think we <laughs> all the- know the missing <laughs> element of Crazy Stupid Love, which is jazz. Mm, yes. Well, well. No, but this is the other thing with Crazy Stupid Love is like people were so eager to see Emma Stone finally get a rom-com and people were like, finally, Ryan Gosling isn't fighting against the fact that he's the movie star. Yes, that was a big problem for him for a long time. But then he was like, yeah, but I'm going to do a Bronx accent though. (laughs) You're like, all right, Gosling. Give me all of that you got. (laughs) I'll take it. like four or five times though. Like the point that you wonder if he thinks that's his real accent from Hamilton, Ontario, where he grew up. (sighs) This is what I like about him. I have seen him in interviews say, 
when I was young and I was a child actor, I thought my voice sounded lame <laughs> and all the guys I thought were cool in movies had New York voices. So I trained myself to talk like that. And now I, I don't even like it doesn't even feel like it's me putting on a voice anymore. Like he owns up to it being bullshit. See, that makes me feel sorry for I child love. actors again. Like yeah. Ryan Gosling, very totally. talented, maybe would have been better off he'd started when he was 18. He was in the maybe. Mickey Mouse Club. Yeah, he with was. Justin Timberlake and Britney he Spears. Was. Right around the time of uh, the Sleepless in Seattle. Oh, is that the movie we're talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I think this is what you're proposing, Katie. What you're proposing for child actors is children are allowed to be in movies and be great, and then they can only do one job. <laughs> yeah. You're allowed to do one maybe, job before you're 18. Yeah, maybe you get to be no, in one movie. You get to be in one movie. You get to do like eight TV guest spots. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely not One series a for under two seasons. Yeah. Like, it's like, it's a different, like, it's like a, a punch card. Mm -hmm. But you're only allowed to do a certain amount of work before you're 18. And then you got to go sit on the fucking yeah, bench. Go to school, go to prom, don't be famous, don't go to the Oscars. And if you like, don't want to go to college and start acting, like, I think you can go for it. Uh, but otherwise, it's just too risky. There's too many bad versions of the story. I want to be a child actor so badly and I am so happy it didn't happen. Well, yep. Gabby Hoffman, actually, I think she had like her childhood was very strained and she is yeah. now a yeah. like very, you know, great adult actor. Like she's turned out pretty well. But I think she's talked about how like weird her childhood was. Well, her mom what? was and like her, a Warhol right. superstar, right? Her dad was a soap she was opera Diva? actor. Was that her v name? Viva, Viva? Hoffman yeah. or whatever. Viva. Viva yeah. was her name, but like her last name was Hoffman. Um, and yeah, she's like a weird kid who lived in the Chelsea Hotel. Like, I mean, it makes sense yeah. that she is completely great on camera because you're like, yeah, this kid is a performer. She's a born performer. And she's been talking to adults her whole yeah. life. Yeah. And she's, yeah, yeah. she, I mean, she's great. And this is our life in a very different role. She's playing more of a sweet, like kind of, um, you know, shy kid. And in this, she's playing a, a bat. I mean, when I was a kid, I, all right, so I saw this movie when I was like seven years old. I thought she was the coolest. Oh my God, of course yeah. she did. Yeah. She had access to a computer where she could just get plane tickets. And she with does no money. acronyms. <laughs> but she also has a big gap where she kind of disappears. I mean, she was like huge child star, huge in the 90s. Yeah. And then she does like, you can count on me in 2000, does one movie in 2001 that I haven't heard of, then doesn't do something until 2007 that I haven't heard of. And then a Todd Solon's movie in 2009. It's like post 2010, she comes back. Yeah, transparent. But she really barely acts in the back. 2000s. Yeah. Wait, what? Sorry, what? What? What brings her back? Transparent is the thing that like brings her back. I, I, no, girls as well. But yeah, yes. Like, oh, and I remember right. I seeing her and being like, "Who's this?" And then being like, "Oh, it's the kid from like." Sleepless in Seattle. From now and then, and Field of Dreams. She's so great in freaking uh, Obvious Child. It was there was that like 2014. She was just right. suddenly like back. Right, right. And she does. I mean, like yeah. she does in the early 2000s. Private Practice, Good Wife, Homeland, Louis. One episode of sure. each. Popping then in. Eight episodes Doing of pop Girls. In. Right. So she just knows everybody in New York, and it's just year. like, hey, put me in your thing. Yeah, I decided I want to act again. Yeah. Um. Like, she seems like someone who maybe took the healthy time off to be like, let me, like, work on myself. I'm sure yeah. she's talked about it. She's had, yeah, yeah, she's she's been through it all. Um, but she's great. But And she's the even more precocious child. Super like, precocious. Like, a thing that shouldn't work. <laughs> I mean, they dole her out. They bring out. in a height. They dole her out. Like, yeah. and, and she yeah. kind of makes sense. I feel like if you're a parent, I feel like maybe, Katie, you're about to reach this point where your kid starts making friends and like one of your kid's friends, you're like, oh, that kid's funny. Like that that kid is yeah. the grown up, the grown up kid, the kid who talks to adults all day. Well, like, and like the scene where like they're in the egg chair and like Tom Hanks closes the door and then he like cracks it because he's like, he doesn't think they're right. going to like make out. Like they're no, not old enough for that. But he's like, this, I'm keeping an eye on what's going on here. Did it occur to you guys how much, like, between this and Home Alone, which is, like, all the rage at this point, like, this concept of children <laughs> flying by themselves in New York City is, like, <laughs> in know. real life completely terrifying? And they're like, I nah, mean, it's fine. This Mulaney go. jokes about this. is like, it's the dawn of kid independence. Like, before then, like, kids can't do anything. <laughs> yeah. Well, and also, bl Blank Check, the movie is 2094. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Right, this is the era where everyone's latching onto this idea of like a kid with a computer can do anything. <laughs> if you give a kid with a computer, we don't know how to work the damn thing. Can things. rewire. <laughs> right. right, 
It's like you have like war games in the 80s and then by the 90s they're like now everyone has a computer in their home and kids are eight. <laughs> and if you give them a keyboard and a credit card they can number. Fly, they could buy a mansion. <laughs> <laughs> so this movie begins and I'm taking us into the plot because I we're going to do it. Um, the movie begins with the funeral of Sam's Sam's wife, right? We're in Chicago. It's such a good opening. It's a great yeah. opening. Yeah. And it establishes such a clear rhythm right off the bat. Well, and it, like the, the pan up to reveal the Chicago skyline, it's like magical in this way where they're on this like big, beautiful yeah. hill in a cemetery. And it's like, whoa, I, I don't know where that place is in real life. I assume it's really a cemetery. So it establishes yeah. this like beauty and like it's like a glossy movie, but it's got this really like heartbreaking thing happening in the beginning of it. And same with his office. And I think the next scene. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, you have those three scenes at the beginning that feel like they're scenes from the end of another movie. Right. They are not traditional introductory scenes, not just in terms of what's happening story-wise, but even just how like uh, uh, dramatically you are dropped into relationships and emotions and sort of vernacular between these people. And it moves pretty fast. I think that's Efron's uh, skill as a screenwriter. Is she's like, totally. let's cut the boring shit out. Let's just like do the good scenes. Yeah, right. Um, and you're, that's what she's doing. And yeah, there's the funeral. There's the scene in the office where he kind of snaps at his boss. And his boss is like, you get what are you going to do? And he's like, Garber early. Ugh, Garber. Gar- Garber oh is God. just, ugh. He's I watched this the oh same night as the Sondheim tribute. So I was like watching this and like pausing to see what was going on the Sondheim tribute. And Victor Garber shows up in the Sondheim thing and his mustache. You guys have seen this, like his, his quarantine mustache is yeah. incredible. And then like yeah. seeing him in this when he's like younger, but still like a silver Fox. Man, he's, snack. Just imagine if he was your best friend. Wouldn't you just thank <sighs> God every single day? You just <laughs> wake up and thank the, thank the angels. <laughs> they bless you. Isn't with- Jennifer Garner his best friend? Yeah. Uh, well, she, yeah he walked her saying- down the aisle at her wedding to Ben Affleck. Yeah. I'm, well, then I'm sure I hope she thanks the gods. <laughs> she should. <laughs> but I'm saying, you know, um, like just just uh, very comforting to have. How lucky friend. Hank says. Um, Here, here's a thought I had watching this movie, because the other friend is Rita Wilson. Of yep. course, Tom Hanks's real life wife. She's she's great. There is there is a certain visual similarity between Rita Wilson and Meg Ryan. Yeah, sure. Hmm. There, the scene when she's in the car, the whole extended sequence of her in the car listening to the radio broadcast, I kept on whether it was the angle or the lighting or whatever going. There's a certain, and the fact that Rita Wilson's in the same movie that I had just seen her face, but I was like, there's a certain similarity between the two of them. And I, I wonder if some unconscious level, that's why Hank's and Meg Ryan work so well <laughs> together, even though they barely have any screen time together. Well, they movie. had been in Joe versus the Volcano. Yes. Um, so there's that. Well, Rita uh, Wilson's also supposed to look like the bad girlfriend. Like, there's the whole plot point about her hair looking the yep. same, which is a, uh, yeah. man, that hair. I, did you guys, my mom had that hair at this period. I don't mm-hmm. know if you guys had people in your life who had the triangle curls on top of their head. Definitely, yes. It was a look. It worked then, somehow. My mom had, like, like Dana Barrett, like, like post-possession Ghostbusters hair. <laughs> she was blonde, <laughs> but had the, like, just the mountain, like Gene Simmons, <laughs> like, present day. <laughs> it, it was insane. It looks so heavy. That's a uh, lot to maintain. Yes. I can't even imagine. It, yeah, it's funny that the, 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 the sort of size and billowy, you know, like big glasses, a lot of that stuff from our youth is back, but the hair has not returned at all. No, I, but no. Meg Ryan's hair in this movie, it is such a spectacular, like, creature unto itself. I mean, David, your, your Zoom background right now is her hair is like, the width of her head, like behind her shoulders, <laughs> it's, it's the, in the poster, like it's a huge. Mane. Like, because often she like <laughs> yeah. wears it up, and she's got like ponytails. She's like very like, pretty long ponytails. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That long braid. Um, but anyway, so after the he snaps at his boss, and his boss is like, "What are you gonna do?" And he's like, "I don't know. I guess I have to move to Seattle with my child." <laughs> um, Get the uh, fuck out of here. Yes, uh, Jonah calls the radio show. And Meg Ryan is introducing Bill Pullman to her, or is telling her parents that she's engaged to Bill Pullman. Like, we're right in it. But, but David, they also introduce the model of the United States, that little globe, which they introduce over the opening Yeah, they like, it's like a map it's they pull down. It kind of clicks down. 
No, I'm saying the model that Nora Ephron uses for insert shots that is my virtual. I know background. what you're talking about. It clicks down. It, there's a sort of a, a it pulls down. I love I love the visual of it pulling down. I have seen this okay, movie well, Griffin sure. a hundred times. <laughs> Fair. Griffin, I recorded you it an hour ago. You should remember. <laughs> I recorded it off the BBC. Uh, onto a videotape and I would watch it over and over and over again to the point that my mom was confused, I would say. <laughs> she Because I remember my mom when I was like eight or nine being like, yeah, that's kind of like a chick movie. <laughs> like, like not, not in a bad way, but just sort of being like, it's interesting that that's the one you've keyed into. Like a, a, a sort of like slightly more grown up comedy. You know, I'm surprised because you there's no kissing in it, David. And as we know, you love kissing. Uh, you're right. In fact, not only is there no very little kissing, but it, when Tom Hanks is kissing someone, Jonah calls the radio to, to try and stop it. He's like, we he yells about spiders. We must bring an end to the kissing. Bring my bring. Bring my bring. Bring my bring. Bring my bring. A little slow on the response there. David, I think someone's trying to zoom bomb us. Can you just let them yes, in? Yes, of course, Quickly of course. Virtual nice. Hello. Hello. This is Captain Chesley Sullenberger. Oh, my God. The hero of the miracle on the Hudson. I'm not a hero. I'm just a man doing his job very well. Uh, of course. I'm so sorry, but you did save 155 souls on that fateful day. Uh, after you experienced complete engine failure on U.S. Airlines Flight 1549. No so one had ever experienced anything that like that before. No, no one had, and you eyeballed it, and you did a great job, and we salute you. We're talking about zero double engine failure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. There was no thrust, zero thrust left. There was no thrust. Nope. It was a forced no thrust. water landing. It was a forced water landing. Um, that's, that's very great, but is there any other reason you're here? I mean, it's an honor to talk to you. David. You mentioned that I saved 155 souls aboard that plane. But recently I've been dealing with great loss. Are you, okay, go on. I was unable to save 155 hairs aboard my head. I, I don't think I knew that. Are, are you been falling getting out a little thin on top? Drain. I'm getting a little thin on top. I lost 155 hairs. Look, two out of three guys experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35. And I'm from, in my 60s. from what I know, you're, you're in your very late 60s. Yeah. So the best way to prevent hair loss is to do something about it while you still have some hair left. Okay. And I've seen pictures of you. You're looking at you now. You still got some hair up there. I, so I, I got some hair I can save, but I was in the shower the other day and it was a tragedy. The hairs crashed down into the floor of the shower. It was a forced water landing. <laughs> well, you used to have to go to the doctor's office for your hair loss prescription. But thanks to our friends at Keeps, you can visit a doctor online and get hair loss medication delivered right to your home. They make it easy. They deliver your medication every three months so you can say goodbye to pharmacy checkout lines and awkward doctor visits. The okay? last time I went to the doctor, it was very awkward. Uh, the absolutely. The cops made me go. I wanted to complete the manifest, take the attendance of who had survived the forced water landing. They were checking my heart rate. And then a man came in and told me that there were 155 passengers on board, 155 survivors. Talk about an awkward doctor's visit. Uh, right. Well, I'm so sorry about that. Uh, Keeps has generic versions of the only two FDA approved hair loss products out there. You might have tried them before, but you probably never tried them for this price. OK, and the treatments can take up to four to six months or more to see results. So it's important to act fast. The sooner you start using it, the more hair you're going to save. And you, you know all about saving. I'd like to save 155 hairs. OK, well, maybe you can even save more than that now. You can find out why Keeps has more five-star reviews than any of its competitors, and nearly 100,000 men trust Keeps for their hair loss prevention medication. Treatment starts at just $10 a month, plus for a limited time, you can get your first month free. David. Yeah. I don't want to call my shop, but I think this has been a terrific ad read. <laughs> You've, I, I, you're a consummate professional, and unsurprisingly, you're nailing this. Now, listen. I eyeballed it. You did, and you did a great job. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash check to receive your first month of treatment for free. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash check. Keeps.com. Sounds like an unprecedented deal. It's an unprecedented deal. Keeps.com slash check. Well, everything is unprecedented until it happens for the first time. 
Wait, can we talk about her introducing Bill Pullman to her family, though? That whole yes. scene in that like yes. beautiful colonial house. Like David Hyde Pierce is in it, obviously, which is uh, amazing. Uh, and it's just so funny. It's so Nora ephron of like all yeah. of these old relatives talking to each other in these side conversations. And like Bill Pullman, like he's introduced as a drip because he's allergic to everything. And you see how she loves him for it, even yeah. though like everyone she in the room is like, okay, he's the guy. Yeah, and he's so cute. Like, of course, she loves Bill he's Pullman. To everything. Yeah, he is. He is very handsome in this yeah. movie. He has in, in a patrician s- sort of cutie goodness suit. Yeah, but it is a very skilled comedic performance to make it clear why he's kind of lame while not making it feel like why did she ever end up? Right. Like this him? is this mm-hmm. is like the he's got to strike a very particular balance. This is like the the blueprint for the Baxter, right? Like this is the Baxter. This is the right? one. Like obviously right. there are other right. versions of this in so many rom coms, but he no one ever did it better. He has his three year you shouldn't marry Bill Pullman run. <laughs> well, because <laughs> which is sleepless in Seattle while you were sleeping. Right. And then Mr. Wrong, which is the ultimate. Is it why you were asleep? She marries Bill Pullman in that. Like, in that one, she's in love with Peter Gallagher, and he's the one who swoops in while Peter Gallagher's in a coma. Well, but in while you were sleeping, she shouldn't marry Bill Pullman because she she supposedly loved Peter Gallagher. That was her crush. So she's sort of like he's sort of the like, oh well, wait, maybe. But yes, yeah. he used the actual romantically. But yes, Mr. Wrong, the poster is Ellen turning to the viewer and going, ah, yeah. at the idea <laughs> of, of having to marry <laughs> Bill Pullman. Right. I've never seen Mr. And Wrong. And in that they're period, different. he they're... plays a president Independence Day, right? He like does. it's all he within does. the That's same. That's the same year yeah. as Mr. Wrong. <laughs> That's what's you so crazy. You definitely don't want to be he his wife this... and die via aliens. Right. He does this run where there are different versions of it, but three movies in a row, three years in a row, where it's different takes on the perils of marrying (laughs) Bill Pullman, (laughs) why you should show caution. And then he ends that run and he's like, hold on, hold my beer. I'm going to be the president of the United States and stop the alien invasion with my bare fucking hands. Give me a fighter pilot helmet. Where's my jet? It is funny that he's an Independence Day. Like, objectively. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's just yeah. kind of funny. Like, Jeff Goldblum, Will Smith. Jeff Goldblum, it's funny, too, but he, you know, he made a lot of action movies, you know. Are you aware Will that Pullman- Harvey Firestein is in Independence Day? Like, that cast is yeah. bananas. But we were talking about this on our Stargate episode, that that was part of Emmerich's whole thing. And Jurassic Park also popularized this of, like, what if the concept is so big, you don't need to cast any box office right. draws? Yeah. You cast people who are well-established but aren't like really in this zone. So it's like Will Smith's done one action movie. He's mostly a sitcom star and a rapper. Bill Pullman is mostly a rom-com Baxter. Right. (laughs) And then Jeff Goldblum is the most like blockbustery guy of the group because he had played a scientist as the third lead in one other blockbuster. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And then Mr. Wrong was about a man who was so wrong that he's the mister of being wrong. I guess. I mean, have you, has anyone seen Mr. Wrong? <laughs> I mean, it's I've about Ellen not to. wanting to marry a man like before she ever came out. It has such like weird symbolism to it. It's like, like you don't need to. It's also like a year it's before she came out. one movie. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's like her one, like, is Ellen a movie star movie? The, yeah. the, the other movie she's in is like Ed TV. Like, I, I feel like she's in very right. few movies. Um, but anyway. No. In, yes, in Sleepless in Seattle. He's a nice man. He is allergic to a lot of things. He definitely, Everything. he's definitely very into Meg Ryan. Um, mm-hmm. But they have a sort of a, there's like a routine to their relationship, right? Like with the humidifier and the, you know, totally. the pajamas and the, right? Like she's so good at all that behavioral shorthand and that opening, the introduction scene, because it's coming after the cold open of like you getting this, this quick shot of all of Tom Hanks's sadness and resetting his life. And then right after the credits, you get that extended two shot of Meg Ryan and Bill Pullman in their separate cars as she's briefing him on all the things not to bring up with her waspy relatives. (laughs) Love those opening credits. And it's so good because it's like, oh, amazing. But it's, it's that fine line of like, they have really good comedic chemistry as actors, but they don't have good romantic chemistry. So they're charming enough together that you're not like, why did she ever date him? Because I hate movies in which someone is very close to marrying who's someone who's either a psychotic such person. a monster right, yes. or so boring. Yeah, right. No, you get it. Right. 
it's it's like another thing that they just strike the perfect balance. And then, yes, as you said, Katie, she introduces him to the waspiest collection of character <laughs> actors. It's just like, here's Dana Ivey. Here's Francis Conroy. Oh, she's so funny. Everybody. I love Man, Francis, Francis Conroy. Did not know I that love- was coming. Francis Conroy and uh, and the husband, whoever's playing her husband, where they're like, no, you have to take Harold. it seriously. They're so funny. <laughs> yes. I wrote down in my notes, Harold's allergic to every type of bee. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like that is Efron like skewering, like, you know, whatever. I, I forget. Uh, I guess she never. There's the two other people who like wasp. overexplain like the Pride of the Yankees thing where it's like, oh, yes, yes it's referring to whoever. Luke Gehrig, right, I can't remember who well, it was. Like you see, yeah. right, we yeah. cut to the other side of the table where two of the older people are like it's it's he's doing a movie reference. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it echoes to another part of the table that then has to process it. <sighs> but then her in the attic with her mom sets up this whole thing that I didn't realize because I had not seen the movie and I'd only t- heard it talked about as like oh the perfect semi modern rom com. Yeah, is that this movie has this weird like scream strain to it where it's also about characters and their relationships to romantic comedies mm-hmm. yeah I, and you and know, to a, that like a, a romantic an affair, drama right a fair right. right but a fair to remember functions like jamie kennedy in this movie <laughs> You, you mean Jamie Kennedy and Scream? <laughs> yes. Oh. Like setting out the rules. I was because, like, did yes. Jamie Kennedy experiment? What was that show about? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that movie keeps on Xing them, Katie. <laughs> I don't know what uh, that show an, affair, an affair to remember, which is like not a big hit at all. Like sort of like a a classic sappy movie, I would say, rather than a classic movie. Like probably hey, only- gets remade. Literally the next year as Love Affair with Warren Beatty and Annette Bening. Uh, yes. Yeah. yes. Well, because An Affair to Remember is a remake of the original Love Affair. It's been, it's like a fucking star is born. Right. They keep going to that well. Um, <laughs> and um, wait. Oh, yeah. But yes. And then I think Thor at Love and Thunder is going to be also <laughs> yeah, a loose right. remake. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, I like when when movies watch movies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. And this movie is constantly in dialogue with that movie. Yeah. And its characters are in dialogue with it. And they're talking about, like, Hanks is the person who's like, life isn't a movie. Like, it, it, this isn't how it works. Sometimes you end up dating someone who's kind of boring after you lose the love of your life because it's not going to happen twice. And Meg Ryan and Rosie O'Donnell are constantly, like, checking this movie and going, like, I don't know. Is that insane to believe in this? Right. It's like, the movie kind of checks out that I should be crazy right now. Like the movie, the movie's yeah. kind of telling me like the, the, in this movie, people, people keep saying it's a sign, which is a silly right. thing to say, but, but arguing over whether right. or not that's a thing. Yeah. And, and specific characters flip flop on whether or not they believe it's, but I, it's a whole movie about essentially Meg Ryan being like, am I crazy? Whereas Tom Hanks, he, cause she does with, you've got mail. She repeats the trick, right? It's like, there's going to be two characters in parallel who don't really meet each other. Of course they do meet each other and you've got mail, but they don't know who they are. Blah, blah, blah. Right. But like that, the cheat code of you've got mail is you keep them not realizing the identity is right. while also giving them a lot of scenes. Right, together. Right, exactly. But in sleepless yeah. in Seattle, not only do they not meet Tom Hanks doesn't even think about Meg Ryan at all for the entire running time of the film, save for two seconds when he sees her in an airport, basically. And that's, you and know, in the street and, and in the street, in the but street, he looks at her, where but he's like, like, this is the hottest woman I've ever seen in my life. But and like, then I guess I'll just she's really hot. Hot. we need to talk about it. She is but really like, hot. She's incredible. We're going to talk about it. But like Meg Ryan is spending the whole time being like, am I crazy? I think I'm in love with this guy. Should I get yeah. married to Bill Pullman? Should I go to New York? Should like, I watch him and his child on a boat? Yeah. Should I do that? Whereas Tom <laughs> Hanks is like, she's dating. Yes. The dating world has changed slightly. And like, I don't know. My kid's being a pain. Like, it's just not on his mind. And this- he's talking to his dead wife. Yeah, and he talks yes. to Carrie Lowell, uh, who I love. And ag- love again, Carrie. as a movie to watch as a kid growing up, especially as like a girl with having crush on boys, like all of middle school is being like, oh my God, well, he walked past me in the hallway and like, he didn't really look at me. I don't know. And they're all like, wait, who was that? Like, like this is exactly <laughs> all of young relationships is like the yes. girls are obsessing and the boy is like, I got to go. I'm, I got soccer practice. <laughs> and Jonah, Jonah uh, only. I was the opposite. Right. <laughs> well, 
Jonah only wants like his big reason for being in on Annie because he's like or when he reads the letters he's like this girl Annie she's great is because she mentions the Baltimore Orioles in her letter and he's like wow <laughs> she seems pretty cool but that's like another sort of magic trick of this movie is that he's on two tracks one track is anytime the son mentions the letter he's like get that fucking letter out of my right. face I don't even want to talk about it I'm not paying it any mind it is not even anywhere within my range of vision and then the other track is two times I saw this lady who literally made my breath stop. That's a thing in my back of my mind. But those two things are in no way connected. Who I followed through an airport. As I'm aware. And, and right. then there are these sort of moments like what you're saying with the Apple Griffin where like he'll say something about his wife. And then we see Meg Ryan kind of echoing the behavior. And it's sort of like, oh, yeah, they, there's something here that they, they're like entangled in a way they don't understand. Well, even like the poster, which is your Zoom background right now, is the two of them in two different locations, both staring off into the distance. And they're not in the same space, but it sort of looks like they're looking at each other. It's very somewhere uh, out this there. Movie, yeah, it's a really good cross-cutting movie. I mean, she's very smart without being like too clever about it, about putting those scenes, uh, the scenes of them separate in interesting uh, contrast with each other. There's a part where um, the boy says that like Gabby Hoffman's character told him that they met in past lives. Yes. Remember that whole oh, part? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I just really liked how it was like a dumb kid thing to say, but I, I like love the sentiment of it. Yeah. Cause this movie is like, they don't know each other. They don't know if they're meant to be together, but like it kind of argues like you don't know who you're meant to be with until you meet them. So like maybe they are doing all these behaviors that you're going to fall in love with someday, but you don't know about them yet. Like it, it, it sets totally. them up as compatible without ever having to put them in the same place. Right. You just yes. need an eight year old boy to fly across the country <laughs> and, and make it happen. Himself. Yes. World's it's best just, wingman. It's and a also a cock block with a nice lady. It, it is a thing like the confidence of this movie to a understand if you're going to make this premise work, you really have to put aside some space for the titular radio call. Right. Mm -hmm. Like it's it's mm -hmm. long it's and the so movie good. really like it's slows so down. But also most of that scene plays out of her, with her listening to it. I mean, there is so much more footage of her listening to it without mm -hmm. any cuts in her car than of him on the phone. Because you have to buy that she would be that affected by it. Oh, I was just going to say, and a small detail I like is that she goes to say like the same responses that he ends up saying. Yeah. So they time yeah. out and those are the first little kismet things that happen. Yeah. Also a brief shout out to, um, uh, to her in, it's similar to Jerry Maguire where he's listening to the radio where she's like trying to figure out what to listen to and she just goes along with this horrible verse of Jingle Bells going horses, horses. Horses, 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 horses. Um, so but funny. No, we, we've all had that experience where you're like, all right, I guess I'm listening to this and then you are emotionally involved. Like, which is what is yeah. happening yeah. to her. Like, it's just some and she stops weird in the little... diner and they're all like, ooh. Right. It's like some Love 90s that. version of going viral where everyone's like, get a load of this. This guy's such a <laughs> sweetie. I feel so bad. Like he's freaking Papa with the burger. Like everyone's just like, oh, get the guy a wife. Oh, his kid. Oh. <laughs> but also the way they explain it. I mean, I think what she has to explain to her coworkers and she's like, here's this guy. His kid calls up. That's already weird. It's clear he doesn't even know he's on the air, doesn't want to be on the air. And then suddenly out of nowhere, he just opens up right. with so much vulnerability, explaining all the reasons why he loved his wife. And there's this sort of men are from Mars, women are from Venus stuff going on there, right? Where it's kind of like, hey, God, a man being emotional, like there's nothing like it. And then like when <laughs> Hanks is talking to Reiner and Reiner's like, you split the check now. And he's like, whoa, 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 split the check. Get out of here. Like, I'm not going to do that. And you have to like and the get amazing coffee. Line where he brings up tiramisu, he's like, "What's tiramisu? A woman's gonna want me to do it to her, and I'm not gonna know what it is." <laughs> well, trust me, you're gonna love it. <laughs> Reiner's great in this. <laughs> yeah, give, great give me this. three think... scenes of Reiner in anything, like because in like Wolf of Wall Street, like you know, it's always great when he uh, just pops in. Another great line in that scene is just when they're uh, complimenting Tom Hanks' butt, of and he's, just, he's like, "Yeah, it's a thing now. The ladies, they they all like a cute butt." <laughs> 
<laughs> and it's like the most scenic Seattle shot of the public market behind them where it's like the, right. all of the Seattle backdrop and Rob Reiner looking at Tom Hanks's butt. Yeah. And he says, are we grading on a curve? Great joke. <laughs> but it's crazy to think about like, obviously Reiner started out as an actor, but he was so dominant as a director at this point. Yeah. And the fact that he was still doing this many like three scenes in a movie He'd role. pop in. Is kind of weird to think about, yeah. right? It could be a little popping. I mean, it's like what if what what if Denis Villeneuve just like <laughs> several times a year uh, uh, had like three scenes? No, 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 no. Griffin, Griffin, let's follow that through logically. What if Denis Villeneuve was on the defining sitcom of the seventies, <laughs> <laughs> playing an idiot son? <laughs> For all we know, he might have been. And then he translated, translated yes. that right. It's like a Montreal version of All in the Family, where it's like Denny comes in, like, oh, Denny, oh, he's so. <laughs> yeah. I'm saying, like, what if Denis Villeneuve had been the Dave Chappelle part? <laughs> In a star is born, <laughs> and didn't even or the Dave Chappelle part, and you've got mail. Doesn't his filmography give you such a sense of a sense of humor? Like he really just takes things so lightly and like <laughs> right. wants to like see the funny side of life. <laughs> Look, he's got a feather light touch. <laughs> I think Arrival had like two jokes, right? Like that was, I feel like Arrival is like a laugh riot by his standards compared to Prisoners. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's as funny as a movie around. Prisoners <laughs> might be the least funny movie ever made. Like, Prisoners is <laughs> in the running. <laughs> that's actually a really good yeah. argument. We'll like, see how Blade Dune stacks up. Right. Blade Runner 2049 is fucking airplane compared to Prisoners. <laughs> 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 oh, my God. Anyway, Reiner. Yeah, I love Reiner. I, it is funny that Tom Hanks' is one friend in Seattle is like... I guess just another contractor guy. Like, it's funny that they're friends. Yeah. And then it's Rob Reiner. Like, I, the most seattle person you can get is Rob Reiner. Uh, right. And they're different, like, age yeah, groups. Yeah. Uh, but it's hard to make friends do, in a new city. I'm totally. And Seattle I is famous he, for the Seattle freeze. Like, it, like this is a thing where you people mm -hmm. move to Seattle and they don't make friends for years because everyone is, like, kind of distant. Like, says they're friendly, but they don't make friends. Sure. Um, I do yeah. love that he goes from architect to contractor. Like there's this thing mm -hmm. of like, he needs to sort of shake up his life. It happens all off screen, but it's like, I need to move laterally to something that utilizes the skills I've learned, but I also need to shift a little well, bit. I also, it's just, and, and again, I guess it's partly me as a kid. This is like where I learned the contractor joke, right? Where like with Dana Ivy, where she's like, I want to move. I want to get a different fridge. Oh, right. Dana Ivy is an ad. Yeah, she's, no, she's, got her she's wrong. the she's client. Not, right. She's like, yes. I want the fridge. And they're yeah. like, oh, well, we're going to have to move this wall. And then they do the, like, that's three, four, 12 weeks, right? Like, and she's like, it just has to be perfect. It doesn't matter. She needs matter. room for her platters. Yeah. Yeah. And you think of Nora Ephron as a food filmmaker and like you guys will have time to get mm -hmm. into that. Like there's not a ton of food in this movie, but like the idea no. of a woman being like, no, 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 no. I need room for my platters. Like I, it's perfect. I get it. Um. Anyway, so while Tom Hanks is just living his fucking life and trying to muddle on through and figure out dating and uh, you know, raise a son, Meg Ryan is having a nervous breakdown <laughs> <laughs> and talking to everyone she knows. Like David, Hy I love that early combo with David Hyde Pierce where she's like, I mean, Seattle. And he's like, it rains all the time in Seattle. And she's like, I know. Oh, why would I want to do this? Like she's doing that. <laughs> But she's also like, she's testing out David Hyde Pierce as like, I need a best friend in my romantic comedy to encourage me to take the wild flights of fancy. And David Hyde Pierce is like, I don't know, I married her because she said it was time for I either had to marry her or we'd break <laughs> up. And Rosie O'Donnell has had this horrible romantic history. Like every little snippet of a story you get is so catastrophic, but she's like, ah, I don't know, go to Seattle. <laughs> <Right. laughs> like everything about her is like, yeah, why not? <laughs> um, yeah, she's, she's sort of um, the, I feel like everyone has that friend, like where it's like, they just got waylaid by this bad relationship that they can't shake, right? Like where it's like yeah. everything comes back to the bad, the bad guy. And it's such a convenient yeah. excuse for her as she does her insane behavior. She's like, ah, oh, Rick, he came back up again. Rick. He was on the radio. I don't know what to tell you. Right, right. Yeah, the uh, her being caught in the cupboard with the phone. <laughs> That's very, you know. And the, right. and the like, little white radio that she's like yeah. clutching to her chest. Yeah. Griffin's drinking his rosé. And they cross cut that with 
the son that's the kid screaming and her screaming <laughs> right because right. that's that's his his uh, return to the radio is is when when yeah. Jonah complains about the kissing like aside from it being a film shot by Sven Nykvist the movie is deceptively cinematic in how much it relies on editing yeah. in that yeah. way because it's about establishing a feeling of connection between two people who do not share a frame really until an hour in and then don't again until the end of the second hour. And you think yeah. about what we were saying earlier about her peeling the apple, which I think is happening around the same time in the movie. Like, I think she peels the mm. apple and then like another scene happens and then he brings it up. Like it gives you just enough time to not think about it. And then he says mm. it, you're like, it like dings this faint bell so that it feels like you're discovering it along with them rather than having the filmmaker mm -hmm. being like, hey, look at these two. No, it's I, I think it just she has the confidence to uh, trust that the audience will do the math themselves and that they will fall in love with these people so she doesn't hammer it too hard. She doesn't underline things too heavily. Um, and she knows they're on the poster yeah. and they're going to fall yeah. in love. So she gets she gets the right. genre she's in. Yeah. yeah, that's true. But yeah, it is still a crazy gambit. And I feel like at the time, people kind of, you know, it was a, this movie was a huge hit. It was well received. It got Oscar nominations, but it wasn't like a consensus critical favorite because most reviews are like, it's so contrived. Like you yes. won't believe the premise on this thing. Whereas now I feel like people will be like, yeah, fuck it. Who cares? I don't know. You know, like <laughs> it's a classic. Yeah, right. Well, and it's like, there's a huge part of it is a scene of her basically Google stalking him where she's using yes. the like whatever Lexus Nexus. She's using Lexus Nexus. That's the thing. Now that wouldn't seem as creepy because she would literally just Google and Facebook him. But back yeah. then, it's, right. it looks like she's doing a fucking CIA investigation. She doesn't actually. So she shady. sends a PI after him, which is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. She faxes a private investigator. <laughs> well, know. Ben, sometimes you gotta you gotta bust out the fax machine, okay? For love, Oh, man. Yeah, like this kind of feels like the movie that uh, All About Steve is. I most was thinking on. that, but that's oh, a man. scenario right? where Sandra Bullock. It never sells that she's charming. She's just psychotic. Well, that's the premise is like what if in real she life this would be upsetting. Right. 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 But I'm assuming um, they end up together anyway. I don't Her know. Bradley Cooper. I don't Cooper. think they do. I think she ends up with someone else. Uh, no, no. I've seen that movie. Yeah, she, no, no. At the end of the day, she realizes that he should end up with whoever and she's going to look for someone she actually likes, not Steve. She's, oh. she's no she longer Thomas all Hayden about Church? Steve. I mean, Thomas Hayden Church is in the movie, but I believe he is just a villain. And Ken Jeong is in the movie. Yeah, I don't think she gets yes. with him. Sandra Bullock doesn't get taken to church at the end of that film. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, I guess he's just her friend. She doesn't friend. pull up a pew? He's just her okay. friend. Who's like, yeah, go bother Steve. He's the Rosie O'Donnell. He, yeah, the, yeah. Misguided Rosie O'Donnell. All about Steve. That was, I feel like that movie only, because she won the Razzie and the Oscar the same year, right? Wasn't that it? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Right. Yes. Yeah. All about Steve um, is like a movie that only comes up when you're playing like trivia in a bar and they're trying to like going yeah. through Sandra Bullock's career yeah. and everyone forgets about it. Was that the same year it? as the proposal too? Yes. yes. That's the thing. It's sandwiched in between. But she had been made sort of earlier. For a number of right. years. But she, but she makes... Two humongous hits in 2009. Her career like rebounds so hard and then quietly sandwich in between the two of them is all about Steve. Yeah. Like it's like proposal in June, blindside in November, all about Steve in August. Yep. Um, um, here's the thing I want to say about Sleepless in Seattle. What you were saying about it not being super respected at the time. Uh, I've been watching a lot of The Critic. That has been my binge this week of watching all of the... Uh, 90s uh, primetime animated sitcom The it Critic. It stinks. Uh, there are several episodes where they have extended anti-Sleepless in Seattle riffs. And obviously the point of that show is that character is the super the cynical who thinks all mainstream right. films are trash. But they like go, like there's, I'm trying to remember what the bit is. Oh no, do you know what it is? The, the Ebert, the Siskel and Ebert episode where Siskel and Ebert split up and Jay Sherman thinks this is an opportunity to become partner to either Siskel or Ebert because now they're each going to have their own show. And what he realizes is they should really be together. 
So he functions like the sun <laughs> and reunites Siskel and Ebert <laughs> atop I mean, that the sounds pretty State funny. Building. That's a good idea. But the it, it's a great episode. But at the end of it, they're like, oh, God, this is so contrived. Straight out of Sleepless in Seattle, which itself was stolen from a fair to remember, which wasn't even that good of a movie to begin with. And they say that in unison. And that's what makes them sure. realize <laughs> that they belong together. But it's like a joke that like, we all agree that this movie's contrived. It's pulling so much from this other film and it's so cliched. And now I do think like this movie would, would fucking, I mean, it did get a screenplay nomination. It got a screenplay nomination and best um, original song for Wink and a Smile, which is a great song by Mark Shaman. Um, and, and this is a movie still of the day, uh, Nora Ephron embodies this, but like that kind of Michael Feinstein piano bar type score, right? Mm -hmm. This sort of like great yeah, American yeah. songbook shit. I love it. I mean, Give me to all open of it, your you rom-com with, uh, as time goes by to being like, Hey guys, here's the song, you know, from Casablanca. We're going to put ourselves yeah. right next <laughs> to it. Like it is really calling your shot. Absolutely. Uh, I'm looking at what else is on. I mean, you have Jimmy Durante, Louis Armstrong, Nat King I love Cole, it. Dr. John, Gene Autry, <laughs> Joe Cocker, <laughs> Tammy Wynette. Like you have the couple where it's like, okay, of course, there's a Celine Dion track, Carly Simon, Ricky Lee Jones, Harry Connick Jr. But the other ones on the soundtrack are not songs you expect, or at least not singers you expect in a 90s rom. -com. Right. Uh, yeah, and the score is one. very like old school, yes. like big bandy kind of, and then it like eventually veers into like jaunty like '90s caper stuff, and it's it's a little weird the contrast between the two. But also, all love to Mark Shame, and I'm not going to disrespect his name on this podcast. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think there's two versions of We Small Hours in the Morning. They do like the original, and then it's like, ooh, there's the '90s upgrade. <laughs> I just want to quote from Roger Ebert's review where he said the film was as ephemeral as a talk show, as contrived as the late show, yet so warm and gentle I smiled the whole way through. Mm. But that's like more generous than most. Like yeah. Most of them are saying like, this is contrived. I don't know. I guess it works. I mean, basically like, I think critics were very resistant to love story type movies, right? Where they're like, this is... This is Vox Populi shit. This is, you know, whatever. It's fine. This is a good version of it, but we're not going to take it too seriously. We just don't take this genre very seriously. Next question, right? Like, you know, I get that it's a well-executed version of it, but we don't take it seriously. And now people are like, it's a lost art. We don't make these things anymore. <laughs> they were gems. Yeah, that never really changes until rom-coms just go away entirely. Like, I'm trying to even think of, like, how critics treated the last big rom-com to open from a studio, and it probably got ignored. Um, it might not have been very good. Uh, right. I mean, what was the last good studio <sighs> theatrically released rom-com? Crazy Stupid Love. That was, love. like, a hit. Yeah, Crazy Stupid Love, obviously. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm looking here, and it's like, I, I did the Google search. Uh, rom-coms 2010s and the top results it gives me are Big Sick, Crazy Rich Asians, About Time, Silver Linings Playbook, Crazy Stupid Love. Big, That's their Big top Sick five. is probably Big the sick best is a example good one. in there. Big totally. Sick is a really Crazy Rich Asians did really well. well yeah, Crazy well Rich reviewed, Asians is well sort of received. like a quasi rom-com, like, you know, that's actually yeah. kind of like a, a, just sort of like a high comedy, like, but it's got romance. Yeah. Yeah. It's got romance. Silver Linings Playbook, I don't feel like counts. Also, no. that was 2012. It was such, it's been that's a while. kind of a drama. It was such a big hit. Yeah, it was a hit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I guess that's Jennifer Lawrence's rom com, I guess. I mean, I last year I was a big fan of Last Christmas, which kind of got completely ignored. Didn't not make money. I mean, it did okay. It made um, everyone so mad because of its twist. Yeah, but the twist is good and that movie's good. I think people will come around to that. Did you see Last Christmas, Griff? Did you go? Come on. I. I did not. That's Henry uh, Golding, right? Uh, uh, yeah, Henry Golding and Amelia Clark. No, because I was busy. Uh, yeah, I was busy last Christmas. I gave you my heart. Mm. Um, I'm looking. Uh, how here. do you? Uh, I mean, kick train someone out of a Zoom kind of meeting. Of uh, I'm sorry. I just need okay. To okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, a train wreck counts as like a pretty traditional oh, rom com yeah. that was a hit and was well reviewed, but it's even crazy just to like look over as I'm looking at this list and so many of the results that come up are like indie comedies. Sure. There are things like Enough Said and Love them. Uh, you know, Sleeping With Other People, which is my pick for the best That's rom a good one of too. the 2010s. 
um, Celeste and Jesse forever, what have you. But it's crazy to think like, oh, right. At the beginning of last decade, you had friends with benefits and no strings yeah. attached. Right. Like it was still fertile enough that you had those two come out within six months of each other in 2011. And there were like four big stars who they were like, I don't know, rom com, what's the right parent? Yeah, something is yeah, weird. It's like the not- dilemma, the Ron Howard movie, where it's like, right. Yeah. Is it Kevin James and Winona Ryder are married to each other in that movie? <laughs> Kevin, correct. <laughs> and then Vince Vaughn and Jennifer Connelly. Yeah. And Channing Tatum in his first really funny role that uh, I always give myself credit for noticing and being like, hmm, he might go somewhere. And then now, who knows where he's going to go next. But And, and Queen Latifah plays Vince Vaughn's boss. <laughs> Everything about the dilemma but the is the dilemma insane. is similar timing to like Couples Retreat. There's that sort of last yeah. gasp. These movies yeah. that did well, like Couples Retreat was an unambiguous right. hit. But like right, no but one really Right, but it's like people on a poster them. and they're back to back like yeah. this with their arms crossed. Yeah, exactly. But see, I would file the proposal that under, for sure, obviously. But see, proposal I think is a proper rom com. I think the other movies you just listed are comedies about. Couples. Yes, you're, you're right. Like, you're I think right. The you right. think like a man movies. They're not about courtship. Oh, which I think is like a key element of a good rom com. I'm realizing why the rom com died, guys. Um, because in 2009, what? Robert Luketic told us the ugly truth about love. Ooh. Catherine Heigl and Gerard Butler. And that Catherine was Heigl that really was unfortunately she, there at the end. Heigl and Kutcher fault. helped really bury this genre because they tried to take yeah. it over because everyone else was busy doing whatever, you know, <laughs> your dramas <laughs> and your superheroes. And so Heigl and Kutcher were like, we're here. We're putting up stakes. We're going to give yep. you one of these a year. And pretty quickly, people were like, okay, anyone else got anything? And they were like, no. Also, <laughs> let, let's not discount Gary Marshall's role in this whole thing. Speaking of yeah. like, you know, 70s sitcom legends, mm, he, right. he did a bad, bad job. That it's true. Yes. It's true. But in the ugly truth, if you and think I, about it, the heart, the lady holds the heart up here. The man okay. holds the heart. <laughs> Griffin, have you seen the poster oh. where he holds it? It's over his PP. He's saying <laughs> his heart is inside his PP. And what do you um, think that is? Is that the lovely truth? No, it's the ugly <laughs> truth. Ah, I don't find that truth very pretty at all. Uh, I do think, no, Katie, I think that's a good point that the Gary Marshall sort of like, which then even extends into shit like he's just not that into you, where yeah, it's yeah, like, the it creates an artificial inflation where then two big movie stars falling in love together feels small. It's yeah. like five yeah. minutes like, in a movie. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right, you're like, Gary Marshall's knocking that down before the opening credits, and then he's giving you another I also, I have no beef with him, but it is crazy. Those movies are literally just him being like, yeah, you know, it's a bunch of bullshit. We're going to do it 20 times in one movie. You'll love it. Like, it's him, like, (laughs) shitting on his own genre. Yes. And then you get something like, like, A Star is Born is not a rom-com, but, like, that movie comes out, and, like, you know, David and I saw that together trying to film festival, and we're like, a movie! What a movie! And then everyone else is like, okay. Um, but like you watch these two gorgeous, famous people fall in love. You're like, what? What is this witchcraft I'm watching on screen? Because everyone forgot you could do it. There, there still kind of is nothing more effective no. than watching two beautiful people fall in love. No, in the there is nothing better. <laughs> and Sleepless in Seattle better. is like, I'm going to give you a fucking sliver of that. You're going to get one minute <laughs> yeah. of that. And, and you're, you're going, going to walk out happy. So hard when it happens. <laughs> It is it is the most exquisite edging. It's Nora Ephron just like swirling. You're not her gonna get anything. Yes. To the extent that in the Empire State Building, like there's you know, like she, she's getting in the elevator, he's getting out of the right. elevator. You know, you're like, oh wait, are God. they gonna do it? Like, oh my it's God. designed yeah. it's designed for the audience at the theater to be going like ah, come on, you know, like, you know, come yeah. on, they gotta they gotta do it. Right. So even when but they like, make eye contact for like uninterrupted one minute you're like this is the hottest thing i've ever seen oh my God. right because there's like there there are x factors here i'm violently single i am quarantining <laughs> completely alone i'm reassessing my entire life but suddenly tom hanks and meg ryan hold hands atop the empire state building and i am sorry <laughs> like it happened instantly <laughs> Instantly, and I was like, I it's guess like, it's time for Skywalker wine. I guess it's that yeah, night. It, it's like you're a Everything's radiator. coming to a head. She's a fucking plumber. Yeah. You're a radiator, and she's just like, oh, I know what to do. She twists one thing, and you're just like water <laughs> <Yes>. spewing everywhere. <laughs> Clank. <laughs> um, so what happens in this movie, one thing that you clearly want to talk about is as she grows obsessed, 
She Googled, she Lexus Nexus is him. She goes to Seattle under the guise of writing a story about this and looks oh, upon wait. him. May we pause for a moment that she's like, I need to write a story in Seattle. And her friend knows it's a friend. It's like, no, we'll spend the budget to send you to Seattle for no hey, good baby. reason. What a, what a glorious newspapers. time for journalism. <laughs> It's such a great rom-com friend line where she's like, if you're going to write that story, you'd probably have to travel there, huh? <laughs> she's, I mean, if you really want to do this story properly. She's the wing woman everyone deserves. Yeah. I had to <laughs> dive into the camera. Um, but so clearly, I think a hang up for Ben, he keeps going to it, is the scene where she just looks at him and his kid across the street. <laughs> It's she's, creepy. She's, just she's the watcher. She's Keanu Reeves. If I did that right now, I would be arrested. <laughs> yes, she's the peeper. Yes, absolutely. No, the Bechdel cast she talks is. a lot about the uh, the Buscemi test, and like basically, you just replace a character in a movie with Steve Buscemi, <laughs> and yeah. if it seems bad when he's doing it, then it's probably still creepy. This whole movie falls apart if you. If you do <laughs> yeah. that. Right. But I'll say this movie might actually survive the Chappie test, as proposed by Bilga <laughs> <important> Abiri. <laughs> hey, re- re- repeat the, the premise of the Chappie test, Griffin, for viewers who may not. The listen. premise of the Chappie test is 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 a film great enough that it could survive having Chappie? In oh, it? now now it hasn't been outlined. There's no forced rule about how you have to use Chappie. It's more just. Is a film strong enough that you could put Chappie in there somewhere? I think that part, and I think yeah. part of the premise is that Chappie is so insane that even one minute of him would would just throw <laughs> a movie off, right? <laughs> right, right. So you're like, could Chappie be Meg Ryan's aunt when she introduces or her like family an employee to Bill of the Hallman? Baltimore Sun? Like, I can see that, right? Right. Could right. he be one of the other contractors with Tom Hanks and Rob Reiner? I think Chappie could survive this. Now, I think Chappie standing across the street staring at Tom Hanks and his son would immediately become a horror movie. But Chappie could Chappie could be a day player in this film and it would still be Like charming. the car goes by and he's suddenly there. <laughs> yeah. I am Chappie. Chappie loves mommy. You're a dickhead. I'm Chappie. Chappie does she love goes mommy. To Seattle. I get that. It's important to say. Nora writes herself out of that scene so awkwardly. You're like, wow, they're making eye contact. All she has to do is cross the street. And it's like, mm, it's too soon for them to interact. So um, she's just going to turn around and fly back. Well, that's right. You right. just cut to Rosie O'Donnell saying, and what happened next? And she went, I came back home. <laughs> I mean, sure. it's that thing of her. She's just pushing the boundary of what is not insane, right? Like first listening in the, like listening on the phone or whatever. That's kind of crazy. She does that. She goes and looks at him, but she can't she, because it would just be too crazy to be like, I heard you on the radio. <laughs> like, you know, like, yeah. what's your opening line? And that's her realizing it. Like, it's her like walking up to the brink and then stepping herself back. We'd be like, OK, all right, we're going to do this in a more normal way. I mean, couldn't she just like wait till he gets home and then knock on his door and be like, I'm a reporter and then flirt and then go from yeah, there? She's not using her like reporter cover. But, no, but that would taint that would yes. taint the love. He would immediately be would like feel I don't want to talk to a reporter. Like and then that Yeah, thing. it would or feel Or then gross. she would have to do the rom com thing where it's like, I lied to you, but that was before I knew I loved right. you. I'm so happy they avoid that. I was so certain that's where the movie was going. It is though, just like the more I'm thinking about it, for how much this movie was written off as like, oh, it's effective, but it's just like classic formula. It's so manipulative. This movie is such like an insane experiment to being like, okay, so we all know rom-coms are about two actors together, right? What if we make a movie where that almost never happens? <laughs> and not only that, it's not even like they're like, they have a correspondence. Right, they're not on the phone. They're, just, yeah. they're barely interacting. They barely even know that the other one exists for a long chunk of it. In a concrete way. And he's you know? going, I mean, I guess he's not there because of her, but like he gets there and he knows that she's written a letter kind of like a crazy person and then puts together that she's yeah, like right. this gorgeous woman who we followed through an airport. But like, that's not a lot to go on. No. And a thing that happens off screen in this movie, presumably, is him reading many, many other letters. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. You see how big the stack right. is. Yeah. And they're mostly and crazy. Th- he's. Right, he's so dismissive of this one. Yeah, and he also yells about fatal attraction. Did you see fatal attraction? I love I that scene. It scared the hell out of me. It scared the shit out of Every me. Every man in America. 
Or the way he delivers line, like, that she looks like my fifth grade teacher. She is my fifth grade teacher. And like, I don't know if it really is his fifth grade teacher, but it's so funny the way he does it. He's, he is so funny. Oh my God. He's so funny. God, he's funny. I love Tom Hanks. Can we talk about how weird Tom Hanks' face he's is for a, like such a major movie star? He's very long in this movie, long and thin. It's and sort of hair. like his Philadelphia build, I guess. Like he's still pretty yeah. skinny. He, he's, got, he's got the Howie Mandel 80s Peter Newman hair, <laughs> but also- He's quaffed up. For, for how long he is, he's a, he's a skinny man, he's a tall man, he's got a long face. Every individual feature on his face is round. Like, that's a weird thing about Tom Hanks is that his face is not round, but he's got this rounded nose. Mm -hmm. He's got very rounded lips. He's got soft His cheeks are kind of round. Right. His eyes are very circular. Like, every individual piece of him is round, but it doesn't really feel like a face that should come together. And he is, like, not traditionally handsome, but he also doesn't look like a classic comedy star. He's got such... A unique look. There's that lingering shot on like a cameo on a Valentine's box of chocolate, like in like the window outside Meg Ryan's apartment where it's like two faces in silhouette and you're like, not supposed to get that it's Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan. You're like, no, I know that nose. Like, I know exactly whose profile that's supposed to <laughs> right. be. That was on the IMDb trivia page. It was literally like the silhouettes are supposed to be Tom Hanks. And I was like, oh, fucking of course, course it, it is. is. <laughs> yeah. Like, no one else has ever looked like Tom Hanks other than Jim Hanks, <laughs> Tom Hanks' brother, who does the bonus voiceover work for Toy Story. And Sports. Colin Hanks, who is his looper. Yes. Sure, but Colin Hanks looks a little more, I don't want to say normal. No, he's a little he's more like, straightforwardly handsome, I think. Yes. Yes, he's a little more everyman yeah. in his Hanks, facial Hanks features. is not a guy that you would look at and be like, this is... That, you know, going to be Hollywood's hunka. hottest guy. Right. But then, right. you know, in classic Hollywood, there are the sort of like Glenn Ford, Gary Cooper guys where you're like, of course, they're, they're good looking guys. Yeah. Jimmy yeah. Stewart. Like, you know, but like, this is not like a, a hottie exactly. Like, this is like a right. sort of interesting, striking, you know, like he's a good looking man. He's a he's a handsome man. Right. Um, yeah, Gary Marshall, of all people, because I. He never directed Hanks, did he? Uh, let's see. Penny did. Uh, did Gary? Right. Uh, maybe not. I remember seeing some interview where Gary Marshall was talking about Tom Hanks, and he said Tom Hanks was like a- an actor who, with no vanity, will say like, "Hey, here are the five angles to never shoot me from. <laughs> like, I'm giving you like a uh, some help here. Like, this is a helpful tip." You're not going to be Your able to use the shot. Your lens will break. Like, I'm warning you now. <laughs> right. I'm now trying to. Right. But he was like, there was, it wasn't like a Streisand, like never shoot me like sure. this. It right. was a like, just so you know, if you shoot me from here, I will look so goofy. <laughs> like the guy is aware that his face balances on like such a razor's edge as a leading man. I don't, I can't find anything that he would have ever directed him in. I don't I think feel like I'm spacing on something, like maybe a TV show. But I don't think so. Oh, it must it must have been a TV thing. I guarantee yeah, you it was I a TV so. thing. I think he he did a Happy Days or Maybe he on. did a Happy he Days. He made appearances on Gary Marshall's sitcoms. Right, he must 100% have. that's what it was. Yeah, yes. he was on a Happy Days. He was on like one. So he knew his angles days. even back then. Yeah. I mean, that look, in a way, that's maybe what made him a movie star. He He just had that weird sense about himself. I mean, I feel like, one of the defining things of a really successful movie star is someone who just has such a good sense of how they play. I mean, he per- like they are so aware of their own instrument. Yes, you yeah, know. Yes, I agree with that. And hey, Tom Hanks got a great instrument. <laughs> got a great instrument. <laughs> um, um, wait, I don't want to move too far in the plot, and I don't know if we're here yet, David. But can we talk about the scene please. with Victor Garber and Rita Wilson at the dinner table where they talk about an affair to remember in the Dirty Dozen? Uh, they talk about a Dirty Dozen. <laughs> I, I love sorry, that. Scene. I just. I just need to I need to pause for one second because of course Gary Marshall did in fact direct the Tom Hanks Jackie Gleason two hander Nothing in Common. Oh, there you go. I'm so. We all sorry. remember. See, I knew there was. And something. now we can move on. I knew there was something. Um, but yes, the scene that scene when I was a kid, I thought it was the funniest thing in the world. Um, you you don't think it's the funniest thing in the world oh, now? I, it holds up I, for I me. Do. It holds up great. I mean, just Garber and Hanks just doing the Dirty Dozen, naming every character actor in the Dirty Dozen, by the way, <laughs> which I love. Like, that's a little IMDb game they're playing. Griffin, weigh in. Yeah, no, that's also, that's the scene that's the most like Men Are From Mars, Women Are From yes. Beasts. Yes. Because it's this yes. like 
two pillars between Wilson and Garber. And Garber is even more cynical and skeptical than Hanks is. Yes. He, and the kid is, is there too, Wilson being is, like, ugh, right. girl movie where they kiss. Ugh. Um, but, but I do it's also like just that, such a funny immediate reversal. Like it's just like going yes. directly to them, and the look on Rita Wilson's face like says everything. Being like, "Oh, you all think you're immune to movies that like like hit you in your heart? Like right. there you go." But I love that a fair to remember is so this like weird universal language because they that's he right he's brought up the letter the Empire State Building thing, and she's just immediately like mm-hmm. a fair to remember. I know, I, I of course I know what that is. Like yeah, and they, like it's 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 like nonsense to them. Well, and we talked about this earlier, but like, think about how many different rom-coms or films with romantic subplots from the last 20 years all use Dirty Dancing as shorthand, mm-hmm. you know? Like, it feels like they're constantly riffing on or referencing the same four or five movies. And this film benefits from picking a very specific film that is not like the most popular love story of all time. It's not Casablanca. It's not something that's been like memed to death by sure, other movies. Right. So so it also means it actually like it has some meaning when another character knows the same film they're talking about. Mm-hmm. When another character gets the mm-hmm. reference right. point. And of course that's the magic that allows uh her to go up to the Empire State Building because the yep. guy's wife knows that movie. So he's like, Okay, all right, go ahead. Do you have any bombs? You know what? I won't even check. Just go right <laughs> up Do a lap. <laughs> like, Katie, you were saying before we recorded how happy you are not to be in New York City oh, right now. Understand. It feels very smug repeated back to me, but sure. No, 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 no. But I I I'm I wanna uh represent this as generously as possible. <laughs> You, you are a woman with a family and children <laughs> and uh, multiple lives to be concerned about with regards to a uh, global pandemic. And New York is like uh, uh, the worst place to be uh, read this disease right now. Um, seeing that that fucking oh, security guard God. at the Empire State Building, how much did that make you long? Yeah. For New well, York. and also like behind the scenes trivia, like the last time I saw you guys in person, when I recorded in person, we walked right past the Empire State Building to get we wherever did. it was we were going after the recording. We went to that the restaurant. studio was right there. Yeah, yeah. like I me, mean, the like it, yeah, it's just like the way that it's populated with the taxi driver and the security guard at the Empire State Building. Like I feel like even someone when they're, they're at the Rainbow Room, right, with Bill Pullman, when they have the view yes. of the Empire yes, State Building. Yes, they're at the building. Rainbow Room. There are thirty rock. Yeah, there's like so many iconic. It rewards locations. so much New York knowledge, and a lot of New York movies do that. But this isn't a New York movie until the very end and then you get to it and you're and like it, it's it's got this big heart on its sleeve like the big heart on yes. the empire state building for this city like you feel nora efron coming out in it so much um it's her home yeah, yeah. i mean it's it's, her- it's such a lovely new york movie ring, 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 ring. Oh, ring, okay. ring. david will you get that okay uh, i'm sure Buzz! Oh my god. Oh wow. Buzz, come loud. on, what are you doing, Buzz? Uh hello? Is this is this who is this? Sheriff Woody! I'm Andy's toy! I had no idea that you were quite this aggro. I, I think of you as as being, you know, a, a cute family friendly. What are you figure. talking about? Woody is constantly freaking out, true, Buzz. It's true. You are you are very anxious. I forgot about that. There's a snake in my boot, Buzz. Is there any way we can maybe get you to relax a little bit? Well, it's tough. I mean, this fabric that I made out of is so coarse. Sure, sure. I got I mean, this you're... plush fabric body, and it it itches me, Buzz. Yeah, you're 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 kind of made to take a lot of damage, I guess. So you're 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 not the softest material. I'm low thread count, Buzz. Look, I don't know where Buzz is, but what about Potato Head? I, he's probably. I don't know. I can't say I know where Potato Head is, but maybe. I, and I'm not sure how you could take care of this because you're you're a very small little toy. But maybe if you. If you, you, you embrace some sh- softer things in your life, like sheets or luxury products, towels, maybe a mat, like anything, it, 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 it'd, it'd get your anxiety levels down a little bit. Or maybe.
Maybe I would use that fabric to re-sew myself, and that's I mean, what I was trying to set up. Well, but the thing is, I didn't want to set that up because that just feels like, you know, that's your own personal thing. Like, you know, it's sort of doing surgery on yourself. I'm not going to make you do that. We all but, live in the public sphere these days. Social media, we're all performing for the public eye, buzz. Um, well, so, well, Brooklyn and... They're good friends of the show. They've been advertising with us for years. They're the internet's favorite sheets, but they're also home to bedding and loungewear and towels and more with over 50,000 five stars reviews and counting. Sounds like they have good buzz. <laughs> well, yeah, Rich and Vicky Fulop, the husband and wife duo who founded the company in 2014, wanted to find beautiful home essentials that didn't cost an arm and a leg. Husband and, and wife? That's like the potato heads. They lose their arms and legs all the time, buzz. Okay, you're really yelling. It's really a lot. Bus! I can't believe you've been the star of hit movies. Four! <laughs> yeah, they're on a mission to make you comfortable, and they work directly with manufacturers and directly with customers. There's no middlemen, so no luxury markups for these luxury products. It's just a great product, great service. They got these super plush, ultra light towels that I'm seeing this word here that I'm not very familiar with, ham-am, but it's sort of uh, making me think of your old friend Ham. Ham! Uh, they've also got shower curtains, bath mats, robes. They've got all kinds of great stuff. Oh, it's the party perfect Party Source place. Rex would love the sound of that buzz. Oh, wow. I, I, yeah, of course, Party Source Rex. A great, a great short film. Brooklinen.com is the perfect place to start making small changes that make big differences. Brooklinen is so confident in their product that all their sheets, comforters, loungewear, and towels come with a lifetime warranty. So go on, make yourself comfortable, and get 10% off your first order and free shipping when you use promo code CHECK only at Brooklinen.com. Man, those towels and that bathware sounds so good for all those bathtub toys, Buzz. Right. Uh, it's everything you need to live your most comfortable life. All right, now stop yelling. You're yelling too much, so I'm going to have to boot you from the call. I'm sorry. There's going to be a snake in my boot. It's time to boot me from the call, Buzz. Yeah. Well, now, at the very end, I'm going to get surprisingly emotional, Buzz. <laughs> But to get like that much sort of like impactful New York in only twenty minutes that, at the end yeah, of the film, right. yeah, yeah, and it rolls beyond that. It is crazy. I, I it, there's the shot where you see her running up to the building, and I was like, oh right, we used to record yeah. two blocks away from the Empire State Building. Did you also notice the guy on rollerblades in the lobby of the Empire State Building? I think it's when she comes in or when he gets someone. Somebody goes past yeah. a guy on rollerblades in the lobby of the Empire State Building, which is wonderful. <laughs> But it is this, like, we take it for granted because we, like, uh, uh, live here. I mean, not David, because he grew up in London. Uh, but, you know, I, I spent my entire childhood here. And uh, and now we we would record our podcast every week, several times a week, like, two blocks away. That when a movie represents it like this, you're like, Jesus Christ, the Empire State Building. What a place. <laughs> when was the last time you, know? you went to the top of the Empire State Building? Not since I was, I was like, five, exactly. But six? Yeah. So you were on vacation for books in London? <laughs> <laughs> I went when I had a cousin, a 10 year old cousin visit um, like four or five years ago when I still lived in New York. And I went with her to the top of the Empire State Building, like kind of spur of the moment. Like we went at night. It was really cold. It was amazing. You, you've got to go yeah. like sometimes too, because it's really it holds all of the appeal um, that you think it does from watching this movie. Watching this made me feel like it's one of the first things I want to do when it feels safe. Oh, it's so, to roam it's so funny because I would always walk by it when we were leaving the studio and see like the lines of people going in and be like, mm -hmm. Jesus yeah. Christ, I don't want to do that. <laughs> We'd be dismissive. Yeah. We'd be like, could you imagine going to the top of the Empire Take State Building? Yeah. on the sidewalk. Like, like, like on my yeah. commute every day to those offices, I would like walk in the street and scoff at the tourists, <laughs> just yes. blocking the like sidewalk. Throw batteries at them. Truly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Put them in a sock and swing it and smack them in the head. Welcome to New York. The Atlantic offices are in like uh, Madison Square Parkish, and um, like you can see the Empire State Building, like from there. Mm -hmm. You know, uh -huh. thirty, you know, thirty fourth Street. You can't really see it. You know, and you would yell out your window. You would lift your window up and go, "Get out!" Of I here. feel like four to five times a year, there's a photo in yeah. my photo roll of the Empire State Building that's me just like walking on the street, and being like, "Huh," 
and like taking it. I would occasionally, <laughs> I would occasionally behold the fact that it was just there and be like, well, right. it's the it big building like that's the most up. famous building ever. Yeah. I used to temp uh, right across the street from 30 Rock and it was, but it was over Christmas. So like my walk to like the train was just like me like dodging tourists. Yes. It really was. And I, w- and I hated it. But then like there were days I would walk by and I was just like, it's a tree, whatever. And then like, sometimes I would stop and I was like, this is a really pretty tree. But I'd also <laughs> no. like to recommend. It's a tree. It's, so, it's nice. Tree. Uh, I would also like to recommend though, if you don't go, if you choose to go to the Empire State Building, nice but also if you go to the top of the rock tour it's slightly yeah. cheaper and you can i see always the recommend top of the rock to tourists because i feel like it's a right it's just slightly easier less but, crowded um, yeah exactly. and look look you might get, you might get to meet jimmy in the hallways you might get to meet jimmy in the hallway and he'll be like oh my god this is amazing i oh can't god, believe you're in the hallway so <laughs> oh my god so great to see you <laughs> Or you could see the spot where Bill Pullman got his heart broken. Like, that's yeah. obviously a spot on the tour. Yeah, definitely. It's just the kind of backstory thing that I feel like is part of what Michael Showalter is mocking with that movie, where it's like, the guy I feel like did a little knows Pullman minute. he's not worthy of you got, like, you you got know, more, like The, you the got, breakup you is got so more smooth because he's like, you got more deep pulls? Right. I, I had my shot. I took, you know, <laughs> what are, hey, what are you going to do? Like, uh, I guess I'll just going out there and marry a different wasp. Like, you know, like, right? I don't know. Like, oh, yeah. Well, he also says he doesn't want to be settled for, you know? Like, that's a that's a, that's a, a nice real line. feeling. Right? It, it yeah. makes him transcend past just being a punchline or a plot obstruction because it's like this guy has the emotional intelligence to understand yeah. he doesn't want to be with her because she feels a sense of guilt to not leave him. Like, that is not a happy life. He he really yeah. like shows yeah. a great deal of understanding there. Um, it's a good it's a good fucking scene, and I also like that she's like, I you, yeah. I never deserved a guy like you. And he's like, oh come on, I wouldn't say that. And she's like, no seriously. And he's like, okay, I'll take it. Like he needs the little <laughs> compliment in the moment. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's just it's just funny because like she shouldn't get away with it, but you're so on board with her romance, I guess. And you're so on board with like, look, if she's doing this, she doesn't want to marry Bill Pullman. Right. Like that's what she's, that's what she's right. avoiding. Isn't it herself. though, isn't it emblematic of the writing? Like where I feel like, uh, I don't know. I feel like if it was a boy writing it, he would be like, Meh, and be really upset and yell or do some kind of extreme yeah, thing. Like for exa- yeah. Know, it's well, refreshing. Like the, the most toxic flip side of this is like Bradley Cooper in Wedding Crashers. Wedding Crashers. Right. Yes. Or any yes. movie. Right, but where, right, but where he's like a sociopath and when she considers leaving him for another guy, <laughs> he like starts punching people, you know? Right. Yeah, like does something that makes it feel more morally justified for her to leave him rather than being like, no, it's just, just right. not going to work. But the problem, yeah. the miscalculation Calculation there is then you go like wait but what does it say about Rachel McAdams that she was with this guy for so long <laughs> that's any, that's anytime a movie does that I'm just right. like Where there's like, a big was she elephant just in, in a daze right. <laughs> like has she just not been paying attention to like her general surroundings right. for a like, few years best case scenario she's got the worst <laughs> judgment in the world <laughs> worst case scenario she's complicit she knew <laughs> she knew right. they switched the sample <laughs> <laughs> the, whereas like the only time it's okay is like Titanic where it's just like no you have to do this because yeah, you must well, yes. right. Right. Titan- but- Titanic that's a, that's a great setup it's yes. like it's, right. you know, they're it's outside saving the family. things controlling right. but, but any right. modern romance in which there is another man and the guy is an asshole it, it, like they never think about how much it reflects poorly upon the female character you know yeah um, and, and I like that in this, it's just like, as I, as I said before, they have good comedic chemistry as actors. They just yes. don't have good romantic chemistry and that is very, Agreed. very well executed. So you understand why they're together, but you also go, eh, I kind of would rather see her with Hanks, even though they haven't spoken to each other in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> like, I gotta believe that maybe has a little more electricity to it. But that's kind God, of a crazy does. pitch. That's what I'm saying. Like, this movie is pretty I know, daring. I love it. And it makes you get why the critics were so hard on it, because it does, right. the, the concept is crazy. It shouldn't work. And you're like, 
Yeah, it You're shouldn't work. You can kind of come out of it yeah. being like, was I tricked by this? Like, why did I go <laughs> for this? And it takes time to like accept that it's like, no, it's just that's that's good filmmaking. Well, yeah, it's that thing that like pisses me off when people go like, I mean, yeah, like I love that movie and it made me cry and I laughed a lot. But it's not like a good movie. And I want to say like, then <laughs> it was what a is a five your- star movie? I'm like, no, not. I'm not saying about this in particular. I'm saying when people say that about films that they like, I know but they what feel you're like saying. They should be embarrassed by, and I'm like. If you yes. enjoyed the movie on the level that the movie was intending for you to enjoy it, to that extent, right. then the movie works. Like, you don't have to yeah. say it's your favorite movie of all time, but don't act like, well, I, like, enjoyed it for some other reason. I don't think it's good. It just completely hit me emotionally in every way it intended to. And this is one of those movies where you just kind of got to give, you kind of give, got to give it up, you know? Something's got to give. Someone's got to give. And for me, it's it's a <laughs> bottle of Skywalker Rosé. Here's some things. Okay. Jason Schwartzman auditioned for the role of Jonah. Whoa. Mm. He could have done it. He could have done it. Could have done it. Tom Hanks was doing voice work for Woody in his off days off of this movie. Wow. So wow. this is where Woody, this is Woody. Yes. Yeah. Hanks in Seattle. Right. Um, wow. Wow. Right, because his uh, Woody audition was... Griffin is glowing. I'm just, I'm so in love. His Woody audition was Turner and Hooch, essentially. That was the audio they used to test him out as the voice. I mean, it is that crazy thing. I, we've said it in the commentary episodes, which will have come out by this point, but they hire him to play Woody, and then by the time the movie comes out, he has won two Oscars that he did not have when they started recording. Yeah, it is wild. Uh, disappointed in Denver, you know, there's that montage of the, um, other, uh, callers, like the other famous callers. No, what's that? What are you talking about? It, it's like when she's listening to the radio, uh, the doctor oh, yes, lady is yes, like, yes, yes. our favorite hit. And, yes. you know, sleepless and disappointed in Denver and disappointed in Denver is something like the minute I'm about to reach orgasm, he wants to, he wants a sandwich. Watch, Why don't you make yeah, the sandwich yeah. before you have sex? Yeah. That's Nora Ephron. She's disappointed in Denver. She's the voice. Yes. Can we shout out how good Caroline Aaron is in this? She rules. I love Caroline. Caroline Aaron is just like a, a fucking classic pro character actor, always good, uh, but shows up a number of times in the Efron filmography. I mean, was in This Is uh, My Life. Uh, she's in this is, uh, this is My Life, which she's, I would say, pretty great in. Would you agree? Yeah. Uh, I would agree. You would agree. She's a, also a caller in Mixed Nuts. Right. Um, which, of course, is lots of voice performances. But she's, she's without ruining it, she is the best joke in the movie. Yeah, I think so, yes. <laughs> I mean, I guess it's debatable. What a weird movie that is. Yo, oh Katie, boy. get ready. I you ever seen one. Mixed I'm Nuts? I'm really excited for this. I've never seen Mixed Nuts. Oh I my remember God. it being out. I remember it being like a grown-up movie out at the time but I, I really don't know that much about it other than that it's like a famous Efron <laughs> miss yeah it's an Efron miss is that next week uh, yeah. Is yeah that that's the, the next one, one right that's the next one yeah 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 so so we uh, Charles Rogers is our guest on that uh, uh, co-creator showrunner of uh, Search Party uh, and that was his favorite movie as a child <laughs> It's like David like it was in Seattle, but even weirder. Yes. Yes, it was inexplicably the movie he watched like 20 times. <laughs> um, it's so bizarre. Yep, that's an exception. We recorded that, I don't know, months ago. But in that person? That is our one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's our my one tiny Efron. apartment. Uh, excuse yeah, me. This, Small fine. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Uh, it was the one Efron we recorded early because Charles was flying back to LA and we were like, this is so early. It's like going to feel crazy to do it. And now we're so thankful. We have one episode in which we're all in the same room. We got this one precious episode. But you're going to have to do like a preface being like, well, this was recorded in the before times. As you'll know, we did not know (laughs) 10 terrible things that were going to happen after that. Right. We keep talking in the episode about how strong our genes are and how we'll never die. <laughs> Getting to do advertise our live show and for people to go see we keep, that. We keep sneezing Ooh. on Gathering each other, crowd. but certain. 
<laughs> we're, we're exchanging so many bodily fluids in that episode. It's crazy. And just for sport, like it's not a sexual thing. It's not like a like a trolling each other thing. It's just like we can. We feel that freedom. It's four guys and it's one cup and that's it. <laughs> And the cup overfloweth. No. Let's put it With that. that, let us do the box office game. Okay. On that note. And the box office, this movie came out June 25th, 1993. And Griffin, it didn't open to number one. It's a standard summer blockbuster because this is the same summer as Jurassic Park. Is that That's correct? That's correct. So Jurassic Park in its third yeah. week has made $171 million. Just an absolutely staggering hit. Um, so mm. that is still number one. Mm. But Sleepless in Seattle is number two. What is it open to? $17 million. That's and a lot. Makes, uh-huh. Yeah. And it makes 126 domestic, 227 worldwide. Wow. wow. Big hit. Wow. Has a huge multiplier, as you can tell. It had like a seven multiplier. Um, it's funny that it's a winter movie. Like it starts at Christmas and goes through Valentine's Day. And they're like, no, 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 no. End of June. End of June, I know. Baby. I was so... I was so certain this movie came out in either January or November. Yeah. Like right. I was like so ready for this to be like, is it like a pre Valentine's Day or a pre Christmas release? Because that's what uh, you've got yeah. mail is. You've got mail as a December release, right? Yes. Yes. Man, I am so excited to rewatch. You've got mail. Yeah. It's one of the things keeping me going. <laughs> uh, I'm excited too, but this I much prefer this movie to You've Got Mail. Um, number three at the box office, Griffin. This is the movie that I see as both a Griffin movie and a Ben movie. Oh, interesting. It's a kid's okay. movie. That you think is equally Griffin and Ben. It's it, not it, Problem Child? No. But that movie rules. It's, yeah. it's, well, that's the thing. Okay, that's like, more this is ben. a Griffin that's movie in that it's a kid movie with a kid star. It's like a classic 90s kid movie where the star stinker. is a kid. And okay. then Ben, it's about a kid who's a little stinker. Hell yeah. I think I have a guess. It's, is, is this is it a Macaulay Culkin film? No, Katie. What's your guess? Is it the Dennis the Menace with uh, Walter Matthau? Uh, yes. <laughs> wow. I but saw Nick that Castle in the theater. Me too. I bet you did. <laughs> I saw that in the theater. I love that movie. Can we talk about how weird it is that Walter Matthau suddenly has this like robust box office run? Yeah, it's like where he kids like know him only himself. as a mean grandpa. I know, but it's like suddenly like fucking Lemon and Mathau are back. They're going to do four more comedies together in the 90s. And finally, it means that Mathau is bankable, that he can finally play the role he was born to play, Mr. Wilson. <laughs> 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 like Hollywood living legend Academy Award winner Walter Mathau finally gets to go like, God damn it, Dennis, get off my lawn. Um, and is Joan Plowright his wife in that? Uh, let's find out. You're I correct. I think Christopher Lloyd is the, like, villain? He is. Yes. The way too intense villain. Like, yeah. he is actually, like, a very upsetting hobo in that movie. Yeah. <laughs> yes. He plays a <laughs> drifting burglar named Switchblade Sam. <laughs> Did Ben Wait, write I'm this sorry. movie? <laughs> I forgot about that. That fucking is amazing. <laughs> it's an amazing specific. This is the Rosetta Stone for your personality, Ben. You just didn't know. I think so. <laughs> But God. also, but also, like it, you go, like oh, Christopher Lloyd's gonna play the villain in Dance the Mass. You go, like great, perfect casting. It'll be like Doc Brown. He'll be a villain, but he won't really be threatening. And then Christopher Lloyd shows up, and he's like, "This is my Cape Fear. I am <laughs> <laughs> going for. It. I am pure menace. There is not a drop of comedy in my performance. Like Google what he looks like in this movie. It is so fucking." Upsetting. I saw this in theaters and I have like no. Oh my god, Jesus! <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm not exaggerating here. <laughs> I'm gonna make what he looks Wait, like. Getting... My background. <laughs> oh, no. uh, please get ready. Yeah, uh, Ben, are you looking at my background? <laughs> oh. Oh, uh, oh no! Okay, I'm ready. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god! And then there's there's in the intense. daylight he basically looks like a sort of like a cross between um, Robert Mitchum and Knight of the Hunter and Hugo Weaving and Cloud Atlas is the like <laughs> nightmare demon. But he also looks like the hair you pull out of the drain. <laughs> yes, he looks like your plumber comes in and is like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> like like takes this thing out. 
he also he looks a little bit like Iggy Pop, like died and came back to life. <laughs> Everything right. about and his like eyes are completely bloodshot red. Everything about him is incredible. He should have won the Oscar for that movie. It's so um, fucking good, man. The, the wildest <laughs> thing. reboot Dennis the Menace. It's a great premise. Well, the wildest yeah, kid versus old guy. Yeah. Ben, do you know that in the UK there is okay? Let me talk diff- about it. Let me talk about <laughs> it. I was trying I to you set were that up. Skip over it. I was trying to set that up. Okay, okay ben. David, please. Yes. Well, I grew up in Britain, as you know. It's been established that you know. Yes. Of course. And you live there your entire life. So in America, in Dennis the Menace, who I'm actually not as familiar with, but he's a little blonde child, and he has a slingshot, and he. Causes trouble, right? Like I, that's the premise, yes. right? Where's overall? Yeah. Is there overall. a British version? So oh my god! There's a He's entirely like a Calvin different. Knockoff. There's Get a, out. a what is his name? Bloke? No, no his <laughs> name is Dennis the Menace. There's a British version <laughs> who the wildest thing was was created in the same year. Could a completely different character, both only created simply because Dennis rhymes with menace. <laughs> yeah, and, and I guess in the fifties it just became a thing of like these kids are out on the street. They are two entirely different characters created in different countries in the same year that have survived for decades. Yes. That are Dennis, totally, totally different other than having the exact same name. And Dennis no company has ever same. bought this IP to merge them. At no, you point. can't no. merge them. They're very different because Dennis the Menace in Britain, he's the star of the Beano, which is like a popular children's magazine. Um, he has black hair, jet black hair, oh. and he wears like a red and Crazy. black striped shirt. He has a dog called Nasher who likes to bite. Ben, pretty cool. And <laughs> his I love fav- a biting dog. His favorite activity, which I believe has been softened recently because it is so horrifying, is beating up the the like weak boys in his schools who are called softies and like to have like tea parties <laughs> and shit, and are just like exaggeratedly coded as gay. This <laughs> Dumps them. <laughs> His ultimate oh villain is called Walter the Softy. It's, it's it is it is such an insane relic of like British post war humor. Um, but yeah, it's great. <laughs> David, your Skype, your Zoom background is too much. It's so scary. <laughs> but the other thing is, because of all of that, do you know what Dennis the Menace was called in Britain? The move, this what? movie, Dennis. Because <laughs> they were like, if we call a movie Dennis the Menace and it's about some blonde American child, Britain will riot. Like they'll be like, that's not Dennis the Menace. <laughs> they should have called it Switchblade Sam the movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, then they'd have to like rate it eighteen and like <laughs> only show it like if you have special permission from the government. <laughs> they only show it along the train tracks. You can only see it there. It only screens under a bridge. <laughs> All right. <laughs> David, number, what's the number four movie at the box office? Um, it is the notorious action hit that was a flop because of Jurassic Park. It was like the uh, other big summer movie. Oh, man. In 1993. It, it got a big star, but it got totally crowded out by Jurassic Park. We will do it on this podcast one day. It is a crazy blank check movie. It's from a big director. Huge Last star. picture show. I'm sorry, Last Action Hero. It would be funny if it was The Last Picture Show, but it is Last Action Hero. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's my favorite action movie is The Last Picture Show. It would be it's funny if Sony Hero. was like, yes. all right, 1993, we think we know how to take on Jurassic Park. We're going to re-release The Last Picture Show. <laughs> <laughs> Wide. Less color. We're desaturating <laughs> yeah. it. Even more. Sybil Shepard it, being humiliated on the, on the fucking diving board, that's going to take longer. We added stuff. <laughs> They always make that scene longer every time they re-release it. Number five at the uh, box office is wow. a good movie. Okay. Oh, you know, you want to talk more about Last Action here? I mean, you know, we'll no, talk, we'll about, talk it about it someday. Day. We'll do an episode someday. Yeah. Um, is a music biopic. It was nominated for a couple Oscars. It's it's a good movie. Sort of like a classic '90s music biopic. Very dark, very intense. Pretty great. Uh, what's love got to do with that? Hell yeah. Wow. No, I'm, I'm asking you, what does love have to do with the number five movie in <laughs> well, the box office? Well, I mean, weekend? that is the question. Big uh, summer movie, yes. huh? Uh, what's love got to do with it? Yeah. yeah, it's funny to think of that as a summer movie and as a Disney picture. Right, um, a big summer Disney release that got Oscar nominations nine months later. It's wild stuff. Larry's only not on Disney Plus. <laughs> oh, I, I wish. 
It's on Disney Plus, but like Splash, every time he's about to hit her, they CGI more hair. <laughs> that Splash thing was crazy. <laughs> that Splash thing. Can we talk about the Splash and thing? Did you I see this? They like extended her hair over her boobs and butt to like stop it not being peach. And you think you're prepared for what it's going to be. You're like, all right, CGI hair, no. whatever. And it's so much weirder than you think it's going to be. The quarter crew guys who I love on YouTube who break down visual effects stuff. They like explained they are really just copy pasting. Like they cut right. out a, <laughs> yeah. a section of her hair. Not static, it's like a but skin moving. graft. <laughs> right, but it's like a video clip of her hair and they like cut out a triangle and then they just place it over. So it's also in a loop, like the hair keeps on moving the same way. It's, a, it's, it's so unbelievable. Weird. Anyway. They should do that. I think they should do that, though. I think every movie that Disney previously released that is not so adult that it should end up on Hulu, but a little too explicit for Disney Plus, they should just put Daryl Hannah's hair over the explicit <laughs> parts. Um, we have gone on long enough, though, Griffin. You're right. And okay. it's time to wrap it up. But uh, it's been a great episode. Fun. It's, it's been a great evening, remote, boozy, blank check. Yeah. Yeah. What more could you want? What more great. could you want? Hey, one thing I wanted to say just very quickly about the movie. There's a scene where Tom Hanks is in a restaurant. Mm. He gets a phone call at the restaurant. I've always wanted this to happen oh to God. me. Mm -hmm. The 90s baby. It's never happened. I and I don't know when it will happen again. <sighs> and know. it's his son calling him for something stupid and I can't remember what it was. And he's like, "Are you bleeding? Is she bleeding? Leave me alone." <laughs> <laughs> It do is you know so funny do, that his son wants him to get with someone and then cockbox him at every turn the <laughs> second he meets Victoria. <laughs> he calls her a hoe. She's he calls her a hoe. Her hoe. That Come is on. weird. He calls her a hoe many times. Uh, ben, here's my advice to you. Mm. When this becomes an option again in our society, uh -huh. the next time you go out for a dinner, a fancy dinner, hand your cell phone over to the maitre d'. <laughs> <laughs> so if anyone calls you during dinner, they have to walk over. Yeah, they have to walk and over go, and be like, "Sir, there's a call for you." Uh, sir, apparently, uh, uh, act now because this is your last chance to uh, save your credit card and drink. You know, like that phone call right. I get once. A day. Uh, <laughs> sir, you've won a cruise. Uh, this person needs to talk to you right away. There's some pre-recorded message in Chinese. <laughs> you want us to respond to this, sir? Uh, no, but that's the problem, it, It's an Azerbaijan phone code. I don't know if you know anyone from there. <laughs> People don't call the restaurant to reach you because you have a phone. So you got to give your phone to the restaurant and go. I'm not picking this up. That's and they're like, yes, you. we have nothing else to do. Don't worry about it. <laughs> restaurant industry is in great shape now that the <laughs> country's back open. We're right. killing it. Uh, all right. Well. Someday. Thank you for that insight, Ben. I think it's a perfect note to end on. And Katie, thank you. Oh, oh my God. Katie, I miss for you. For finally nice. joining the Five Timers Club. Oh, we I'm miss you. so genuinely happy about it. And like, I feel like I shouldn't take as much pride in it as I do. But like, I've been chasing Richard Lawson for a long time. I mean, I know he's at like seven or eight times. So it's, it's going to be an eternal chase. But this feels good. But look, here's like a big stat. You were kind of the first proper guest of yes. Blank Check. Yes. We did a year of all the Star Wars stuff, but when we had rebranded as Blank Check, Yoshida's on the two episodes, what's ostensibly the last episode pre-Blank Check and the first episode post-Blank Check that are both on Force Awakens. No, she's only, on, like well, the, she's only on the second Force Awakens episode. Oh, okay, fair enough. Yeah, right. Fair enough. I'm sorry, I forgot. But... You were on like the first episode as a guest in the the format that now exists to this day. I can't believe and that. And it also was when we created the box office game. Yes, yeah. it is. That's right. I I remember it fondly. I remember texting David when I was like visiting relatives for Thanksgiving, being like, I've started listening to your dumb podcast about the Phantom Menace and I can't stop. So I guess I'm a fan now. And uh, you know, great I friendships that. were born from it. It was there. like an early sign. It was an early sign that we were crossing over beyond like Chris Gethard fans and like real hardcore. <laughs> yeah, because you guys have been doing the show for like you know what I mean, like before I started listening, and I was like, all right, yeah. I'll do but it. But our initial like, right. audience yeah. so long, <laughs> Ben. <laughs> <laughs> Not that Ben's still bitter what about it or anything. No, uh, it's fine. 
No, but yeah. I feel like you were like, hey, I'd love to come on the show whenever you're not talking about <laughs> Star Wars. Right. So then you were like the first guest not to talk about Star Wars in the I, history of our podcast. I should go back and listen to that. I can't, like, listening to myself on a podcast is hard. I mean, I, like, I have to listen to interviews I do and stuff like that sometimes. But that, I feel like, has been long enough that it would be interesting to listen back to. It's, it's, it would just be mm-hmm. a time warp at this point. Someone yeah. posted on Twitter the other day a clip from the Wide Awake Praying with Anger episode. And it feels like listening to early Simpsons where you're like, oh, they hadn't figured out the voices yet. Right. Like, I'm not even talking comedic voices. I'm like, literally, we feel like early Dan Castellaneta versions of ourselves. I'm like, the pitch is wrong on Griffin there. That doesn't sound correct. The drawing style, David was still too squiggly. They hadn't figured out the right amount of beard to Fro- have on him chocolate yet. Chocolate frosted milkshakes. I can't do it. Yeah. Mitch does it. For whatever reason, I had an eye patch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they you were like, who's a fun then. waiter? <laughs> they know this fun waiter. <laughs> hey, hey, David, don't have a cow, man. <laughs> and David's like, you listen to me, Griffin. <laughs> I will not tolerate your buffoonery. And then Ben's like, come on, boys. (laughs) Let's record the podcast. He was like that, to be clear. Yeah. That was accurate. Uh, All right, we got to go. an intern at a computer sucking on a pacifier. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Katie, we love you. Thank you for coming back. Thank you, guys. I love you, too. I'm so, like, it's, I come on the show and I feel like I'm stepping into the podcast that I'm listening to all the time, which I'm sure everyone else Mm. does, too. Um, But also, everyone else is doing Zoom hangouts with their friends now, and this gets to be a hangout with your friends that also turns into a podcast that people listen to. It's the best of both worlds. Um, But, uh, Katie... I look forward to doing an in-person episode oh, at the yeah. top of the Empire State Building in yes. 2027. Yeah. Oh, my You're God. The right. idea of going into a tiny recording studio or like really like the old one you guys had where it was truly tiny and windowless. The and closet. Everyone was yeah. yeah. The closet. Uh, closet. And just that, that level of <laughs> intimacy with people again, I think uh, we'll get there someday. But in the meantime, thank you for making it we'll possible for me to someday. come on from my house. This is very exciting for me. I feel like you guys are doing a good hey, job keeping the vibe on Zoom. It's not easy. Thank you. Uh, we're trying. We're Thanks. trying. We're I trying. think we are too. I think we're doing a good job. And the bigger thing is, I mean, when when it becomes possible physically, the the long in the works return of of Charlie on the podcast. Oh my god, we, right. we still need to That's negotiate. Right. Yeah. Thank you to Charlie for having good taste and for continuing to wear all the Forky merchandise that I bought him a <laughs> year ago. <laughs> That Forky shirt is uh, strongly in the rotation, as is the plush Forky. We've got a Fork Forky. (laughs) I feel like I've hinted at this before in the show, but just want to state this clearly. I just a year ago, when David was still anti-Forky before the movie came out, texted you, Katie, and I was like, if I sent you $100 worth of Forky merchandise for Charlie, would you accept that? And you were like, absolutely. And I did. I sent him so much Forky stuff so that you could bother David with photos of him loving Forky. I am and never like, bothered by photos or videos of Katie's kids. I love them so much. I held Charlie in my arms when he was like two months old or whatever. Uh, younger when we were at Trivia. Yeah, we were uh, at I trivia. like that Griffin is this like distant benevolent uncle who like, you yeah. know, they have not, like Charlie has not seen you since he's been conscious, but like he, <laughs> he knows you're the, the, the Forky giver. Good. He, he's the aware that guy. they came from me. I was supposed to go over and give Ehrlich's son a Forky doll. I bought the Forky doll. And then, uh, you know, okay. this well, is no time I, to be transmitting Forky well, merchandise. Asa <laughs> still has a couple of years before he's going to give a shit about Forky anyway. So you got time. Folks, thank you all for listening. Please remember to rate, review, subscribe. Uh, thanks to Ange for co-producing this show. Uh, Rachel Jacobs for editing assistance. Uh, go to blankies.reddit.com for some real nerdy shit and go to patreon.com backslash blank check for blank check special features where you got franchise commentaries, baby. Uh, And tune in next week for Mixed Nuts with Charles Rogers recorded in the before times. Yep. You get one blast from the past episode before we're rocketed back to virtual nice. Yep. All true. Uh, And as always, David, you're wrong. You're never too young to love Forky. Okay. (laughs) All right. You didn't respond to that earlier, and I imagined you had something in your pocket. I was saving it. You're never too young to love Forky. (sighs) 
Everyone, everyone ready? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. David, what get in the character. No, like, no, you gotta get in the character. <laughs> Let me just the save a fucking line. Okay, and the line is: I'm not gonna give you a line reading, but really try to find the character. You are Doctor Marsha Fieldstone. I have to. Oh, I'm Doctor Marsha Fieldstone. I see. 